Hi everyone, my name is Kimberly Stewart, CEO and founder of Arbitration Place. A very warm welcome to the inaugural Arbitration Place Invitational pre Moot. On behalf of all of us at Arbitration Place, thank you to the mooters, coaches, and arbitrators for being here virtually today and joining us for this wonderful event. I know that the mooters and the coaches have all put in an incredible amount of work preparing for the viz over the past few months. We have students and coaches from 18 universities in North America, South America, Europe, and Africa. We are really excited about the program for this weekend. In addition to four pre-moot sessions in which each of the 18 teams will participate, we have five feature events planned for everyone. Right after my welcome, we begin with the opening debate. The resolution to be debated is, this house prefers virtual hearings. For the motion, Neil Kaplan. Against the motion, Ian Binney, with Lucy Reed as moderator. How incredible is it that we have these three arbitrators to enlighten us on what has been and continues to be the most significant subject in arbitration since the pandemic hit one year ago. For Arbitration Place, the move to virtual happened literally overnight and has been nothing short of astounding. We have hosted over 1,000 virtual proceedings with more than 65,000 participants worldwide and logging more than 20,000 virtual hours on our hearing platform. We have over 35 virtual case managers located across Canada, the US, Europe, and the Middle East. A year ago, we had none. We are hosting arbitrations worldwide, covering all time zones and providing our services in 10 different languages. For the debate on virtual hearings, Lucy will introduce Neil and Ian, and I will introduce Lucy in a moment. Also, Lucy will outline the format of the debate and the polling of our Zoom audience that will take place near the beginning and near the end. The second feature event will be a workshop on improving your virtual presence, which will be presented by Gary Gennard, PhD. I have heard Gary speak on this subject, so I know you will learn a lot from him and come away with some valuable techniques and tips. Immediately following that workshop will be the Arbitral Women Workshop on Mentoring and Sponsoring. It will be led by Dana McGrath, President of Arbitral Women, and Ben O'Kimmelman, who have had a long-standing mentoring relationship. Sunday, we will have two feature events after the pre-moot sessions have concluded. After a short closing ceremony at 12.45 Eastern, we will have our keynote discussion on imagining the future of international arbitration. Alex Fessis, the Secretary General of the ICC International Court of Arbitration, and Stephanie Cohen will imagine the future of international arbitration with moderator David Samuels, Managing Editor of Global Arbitration Review. I would truly be remiss not to take a moment to thank David for his support and for the support of Global Arbitration Review since Arbitration Place launched in 2012. Alex, Stephanie, and David will be introduced more fully tomorrow before the keynote discussion. Our fifth feature event will follow the keynote discussion when we will present a workshop on networking in a virtual world presented by Barry Leon, Wendy Miles, and Rekha Rengachari, all of whom will be more fully introduced tomorrow. Now on to the debate. Our moderator for the debate is Lucy Reed. Lucy is president of the International Congress of Commercial Arbitration and a vice president of the Singapore International Arbitration Center Court. She previously served as a vice president of the ICC Court President of the American Society of International Law, Chair of the ITA, a member of the LCII Court, and a member of the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center Board. From 2016 through 2019, Lucy was the Director of the Center for International Law and a professor on the law faculty of the National University of Singapore. From 1998 until 2016, Lucy was a partner with Freshfields, where she led the firm's Global International Arbitration Group. Lucy is currently a leading arbitrator with Arbitration Chambers based out of New York, specializing in investor state and complex international commercial disputes. Even with all of these accomplishments under her belt, Lucy has always wanted to be a referee for a prize fight. Lucy, here's your chance. The floor is yours. Our moderator for the debate is Lucy Reed. Lucy is president of the International Congress of Commercial Arbitration and a vice president of the Singapore International Arbitration Center Court. She previously served as a vice president of the ICC Court, president of the American Society of International Law, 
chair of the ITA, a member of the LCII court, and a member of the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center board. From 2016 through 2019, Lucy was the director of the Center for International Law and a professor on the law faculty of the National University of Singapore. From 1998 until 2016, Lucy was a partner with Freshfields, where she led the firm's global international arbitration group. Lucy is currently a leading arbitrator with Arbitration Chambers based out of New York, specializing in investor state and complex international commercial disputes. Even with all of these accomplishments under her belt, Lucy has always wanted to be a referee for a prize fight. Lucy, here's your chance. The floor is yours. Thank you, Kim, uh, and welcome to everyone. Uh, Kim has just broken the rule, which was to have a very short introduction uh, to, to save time for the debate. But thank you, Kim, for that, that introduction. I welcome especially the Vis Moody's who are about to have the treat of seeing a splendid battle of advocacy. Often in an Oxford style debate, the debaters by definition have to argue for a position that they do not fully endorse or don't endorse at all. I suspect here that may not be the case, but we will see. Let me introduce for the motion, Neil Kaplan, CBE, QC, SBS. Neil was called to the Bar of England and Wales in 1965. And since 1995, he has been an arbitrator in literally hundreds of commercial and treaty arbitrations, including many of the largest and most complex. He's been president of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and served as a judge on the Supreme Court of Hong Kong. For debate purposes though, I want to mention that Neil had a very accomplished career as a star advocate, a barrister and principal crown counsel at the Hong Kong Attorney General's chambers. Uh, Neil is a member of my chambers, but I am sure that I will be neutral in listening. But we'll see. Now against the motion are Canadian, the Honorable Ian Binney, CC, QC. Ian was called to the English bar in 1966. Now I note that was one year later than Neil. So we'll just see uh, if that extra year makes a difference, won't we? Uh, Ian had a lauded career as an advocate uh, in Canada and served for nearly 14 years as a justice of the Supreme Court of Canada. And when he retired from the bench in 2011, he was described as arguably the country's premier judge. He authored 170 opinions, probably more, and many arbitration awards since then. So now you have heard me tell you that both Neil and Ian have been advocates and judges uh, and counsel and arbitrators in hundreds of live hearings, probably not so many virtual hearings, at least as yet. Although with Canada and Hong Kong and Australia being on such far flung time zones, uh, I expect they've had their fair dose of all-nighters again in the past few months. So let's get into the debate. Here's the order of play. We'll start with a poll from the audience, the results of which will be kept secret as to whether you support or not the motion. Then Neil and Ian will each have 15 minutes to present their, their positions in chief. I may then have a few questions for both before their five minute rebuttals. Then we'll have another audience poll to see whether Ian or Neil prevails on the motion. And in case of a tie, uh, I stand ready to cast my vote. So let's get started with the initial poll, please. All right, Neil, please begin. Thank you very much, Lucy, and good evening, everybody. Uh, it's midnight, it's gone midnight here in uh, Melbourne. So I'm delighted to be with you, even though it is that time of the day or night. Um, congratulations to Arbitration Place for setting up this debate. It's extremely well-timed because it was, after all, a year ago yesterday 
uh, at least Australian time, that the pandemic uh, was announced by the WHO. And what a year it's been. I don't need to go through the categories of disasters that have befallen the world by not itemizing them. Don't think I'm underestimating them in any way. But you know, every cloud does have a silver lining. And that's what I want to concentrate upon tonight. Speaking personally, I have to say that I've enjoyed uh, not traveling all the time. I've enjoyed working with my wife in developing our culinary skills. And most importantly, I've enjoyed spending more time with her than ever before. I've enjoyed not wearing a suit or a tie. Although this week I did attend a four day hearing in person in Melbourne, all dressed up with a tie. But as with all debates, it's very important to have regard to the terms of the motion, the precise terms. And the crucial words are, prefers virtual hearings. Now that doesn't just mean final hearings, but it encompasses all the hearings that you might have on the way to a final award. And it doesn't mean that this house would never countenance an in-person hearing, merely that it would prefer them to be uh, virtual, all things being equal. But it's important, I think, if, if, if to answer this question, to have in mind all the stages of an arbitration where hearings might be required. And so I'm going to go through quickly uh, about 10 different things that can be done uh, before the, the main hearing. Uh, the first, of course, is the first meeting with the parties. This is crucial because it sets the scene and produ produces a procedure for the entire case. This can easily uh, be done by Zoom. Um, <clears throat> and when I use the word Zoom, of course, I do mean WebEx and Teams and any other platform. So I'm not uh, giving advertising just to Zoom. Secondly, there are often hearings as to jurisdiction. Uh, these are often raised in bilateral investment treaty cases, but they can arise in commercial cases too, such as raised judicata, time bar issues, or the scope of the arbitration clause. These are ideal for virtual hearings. Then there's the application for interim measures. These are common and sometimes can be done in writing, but quite often a hearing is preferred. Then there can be difficult questions with the production of documents. And these often relate to privilege and confidentiality where a hearing uh, might be preferable. And again, this can be done very effectively virtually. And then there can be the initial conclave with the experts to make sure they're working uh, together for the benefit of the tribunal. And then of course, there's the early opening, a crucial step in most cases as it gets to tribunal on top of the case sooner rather than later, thus meeting the requirements of the read retreat. It also informs the tribunal's subsequent case preparation. And it's an ideal uh, way of doing this uh, 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 virtually. And then of course, more and more these days, we're seeing mock hearings or where one side tests its case in front of one or three mock arbitrators and again, this helps to improve their presentation, and it's obviously uh, very easy to do it uh, virtually. And then, of course, there is the prompt dealing with any other pre-hearing issues that might arise that need the tribunal's intervention. Uh, the use of Zoom and others is a great case management tool, and one that uh, uh, is used more often now than ever before. And then, of course, we have the main hearing. Obviously, the main hearing has to come sometime. But even after the main hearing, uh, there can be a request for a hearing for post-hearing uh, closing submissions. And again, uh, this is sometimes uh, uh, sought. And then, of course, as I said, really, th there are situations where hostilities broke out, break out between counsel. And the tribunal needs to step in and stop it. So to say to the parties, we'll Zoom tomorrow and sort this out. It shows that this is a very valuable case management tool. Now, like other people, I've been living on Zoom for a year now, 
and of a kind that I've had countless hearings, including main hearings. They've all gone extremely well. There's been no breakdown in internet. Uh, the, the screens were perfectly clear. I could see the face of the witness as just as clear as I can see Lucy's face now. A very good use was made of electronic bundles, so I wasn't drowning in paper. There were breakout rooms provided uh, on, on through the screen. Um, <clears throat> and it worked extremely well. Now, I accept what I assume my distinguished opponent is likely to say, namely that there's nothing as good as everyone being in the same room for the main hearing. And of course, there's an element of truth in that. I accept that. There are some cases where it's highly desirable for people to be in the same room. I have in mind particularly heavy construction cases where there are detailed plans and schedules that don't give over easily uh, to electronic versions. The opportunity for the expert to lean over your shoulder and point to the specific point in the plan that's the subject matter of the dispute it is an advantage. Is it better for arbitrators to be in the same room? Uh, of course, it's better for them to be in the same room, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't work perfectly satisfactorily in a virtual environment. Do I miss the social camaraderie with my colleagues going out to dinner and discussing the case? Of course I do. But we manage pretty well in breakout rooms or in separate Zoom calls to discuss the case. And it works very well. Now, I think there are advantages with virtual hearings over face-to-face -face hearings. What I found is that people tend to stick better to their allotted time. I find there are less interruptions. The witnesses appear much closer, as I just said, than, than being in court or in a hearing. And many judges, particularly in Australia, I've heard, uh, who've been dealing with virtual cases, have said they get a much better view of the witness face-to-face -face on the screen than they ever do in court. There are problems. Of course, there are problems. The time scales can be challenging, as I can attest to, even as I speak. It's past midnight here, as I said. This week, I sat from 8 a.m. to 1 o'clock. A few weeks ago, I sat from 5 a.m. to 8.30 for 10 days. Um, and it, 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 it's better than jet lag. At least you can go to sleep afterwards. But think of all the advantages that we're getting from virtual hearings. We're not flying around the world. We're having environmentally friendly hearings. Let's not forget the green pledge for arbitration, which I hope will be as successful as the uh, gender pledge that we all entered into a few years ago. A reduced carbon footprint, a huge saving in costs, I'll come to that in a minute, and no jet lag. Some of you listening today, uh, mooting for the first time, may not have any experience of a main merits hearing in a big case. The costs can be huge. So just try and get your head around this. Three arbitrators and an arbitral secretary flying uh, often from far away, hotel accommodation for them all, Two teams of counsel flying, again, from far away. Teams might be 10 to 15 each side, sometimes more. Airfares and accommodation. Same for the witnesses. And in BIT cases, it's quite common for the state to send a huge contingent to watch the proceedings, all having to travel, all having to be accommodated. And then you have to have the hearing rooms big enough for everybody and with all the breakout rooms and couriering the documents, boxes and boxes of documents to and fro. Now compare that to a virtual hearing. No hotel, no flights, no boxes, because in virtual hearings, we are much more adept at using electronic bundles. A huge, a huge saving in human wear and tear and in cost. Now, I appreciate uh, and I understand, and I would feel the same as counsel, uh, that it's not easy to cross-examine a witness uh, through Zoom. Uh, you're missing a lot of the drama that goes around you that you can't see. 
Uh, but this mustn't be the overriding factor. Uh, people are getting better at doing it. There are several guides out now how to be an effective cross-examiner uh, uh, on Zoom. And I accept that cross-examining an through, through an interpreter is very hard at the best of times, but additionally so when you do it virtually. But that doesn't mean you should abandon the virtual hearing, surely. It just means you should ensure you get the best, most experienced interpreters. However, in my submission to you, whichever way you look at all this, it's a no-brainer. Another point to bear in mind is that this is not new. We think of it as new, but we've been having partly virtual hearings for years. During the last pandemic, the SARS pandemic, I chaired a tribunal from London when everybody else was in Hong Kong. It worked perfectly well. Instead of an electronic bundle, I had a fax machine by my side, and that tells you how long ago it was. There'd be numerous examples of witnesses who could not travel for various reasons, giving their evidence by video. So am I saying that we will never have face-to-face -face hearings again? Of course I'm not saying that, but they will be far rarer in my view, unless everybody is from the same country or from a nearby country once the pandemic has finished. But as the center of international arbitration has moved uh, towards Asia and Australasia, the long distances, costs and risks can easily be avoided by more use of virtual hearings. At the moment, virtual hearings are a necessity. They're a health necessity in most places at any rate. We've got used to them. They work, they're cost effective and efficient. Uh, for the vast majority of hearings, I think they are to be preferred for the reasons I've given. So I return to the motion where I began. And in my view, and I hope you agree with me, there's only one answer uh, to the motion. So I ask you to return an affirmative vote, namely agreeing that this House does indeed prefer virtual hearings. And I'd like to add a rider and virtual debates at reasonable hours of the day. Thank you. Ian, your position against the House motion, please. Uh, yes, uh, uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Neil, for an interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I think uh, it is important uh, to uh, note that uh, Neil is trying to sort of atomize the process so that because it's a good idea to have a documents motion uh, uh, virtually, uh, or a client's meet uh, virtually, uh, you can expand to include the entire motion, uh, which is very broadly that hearings, period, including in particular, I would think, in terms of importance, uh, the uh, merits hearings, uh, should be virtual. So Neil wants uh, all virtual all the time. As he points out, of course, this is, it's not new to have hybrid hearings, particular witnesses uh, being uh, 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 testifying by, uh, by Zoom and so on. Uh, but we're in a, a new era. We have to face up to the fact that what, what is really at stake here is not a continuation of the old uh, practice of using virtual hearings uh, where it works uh, by force majeure. What we're talking about is a preference. We prefer hearings virtually. Now, I think uh, this uh, audience, the voters here, are going to divide along lines of personality. I suspect that uh, uh, those supporting Mr. Kaplan are rather happy uh, that the pandemic has prevented you from going to Vienna. I suspect what you like to do is to sit in your basement or in your kitchen with a computer instead of traveling to the, uh, the grand sites of, uh, of Vienna, the city of uh, uh, Mozart and uh, Beethoven. Why not uh, sit in uh, Melbourne, where it is nicely nestled up against uh, uh, the Antarctica? 
If you're one of these people uh, who is glad of social distancing, uh, if you would prefer not to be face to face, then of course Neil has your answer. Have a, a, a permanent uh, uh, long distance arrangement uh, with your fellow practitioners, uh, witnesses and experts uh, the world over. Uh, but what I, I would suggest uh, is if you want to uh, hear the, Vermi uh, the Vienna Philharmonic in the Grand Concert Hall of Vienna and you, you prefer that to seeing a small screen presentation, uh, then uh, you will support uh, uh, the opposition to this strange uh, motion. There is really nothing like, it seems to be, bringing people together. Law is a social profession. Lawyers feed off each other. They like gossip. Uh, they meet in the halls. Uh, they work together. They concentrate on uh, the matter uh, at hand. They don't stick at home. But of course, if you were one of Mr. Kaplan's supporters, you would prefer to stick at home as he said. Well, do you blame him? He lives in Melbourne. Of course, if you live in Melbourne, you don't want to travel. It takes 24 hours to get anywhere other than Sydney. So it's a, it's a personal pleading, really, as I see it, that uh, uh, is being advanced here. Now, I think uh, I have four reasons, which I will briefly uh, uh, discuss. Uh, firstly, that the, the merits hearing, and that's the guts of this issue, no matter how much Mr. Kaplan seeks to distract, uh, is to get at the truth. And I believe you have a better chance of getting the truth when all of the witnesses, all of the uh, tribunal members, uh, and the clients uh, are all in the same room, uh, in the same time zone. Secondly, I think that face-to-face -face hearings promote dispute resolution. You know, these hearings uh, are not some abstract proposition. They're designed to reach uh, a result beneficial to the clients to resolve the disputes. And more disputes will be resolved in the course of uh, hearings person to person than can ever be done by clicking away uh, on the uh, television set. Thirdly, more things can go wrong with a virtual hearing than in a face-to-face -face, uh, hearing. And finally, I am concerned about the, the future of the profession. It's one thing that lawyers, having learned their skills uh, in uh, 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 an era of face-to-face -face, uh, presentations, uh, can translate those skills uh, to a new medium, to, to the virtual hearing. But what about the lawyers who've never had an opportunity to develop those face-to-face -face skills? What about the lawyers who've never had the sense of collegiality, of dealing with their opposite numbers uh, in a hearing, uh, like the, the grand Japanese room at the Peace Palace uh, in Amsterdam? Of course, if you prefer to uh, do your litigation from an office rather than the Japanese room at the Peace Palace, you will vote for Mr. Kaplan. Now, on the uh, hearing question, a hearing is a theater. There are all sorts of things going on in that theater, in the hearing room, than simply what is picked up with a camera on the face of a lawyer uh, and the witness uh, and the arbitrators. This is a very good case to illustrate that. You've got Mr. Mueller, who is the CEO of Ross, who's going to try to persuade people that COVID-19 is related to malaria. Of course, it's a nonsense proposition. Malaria spread by mosquitoes. COVID by uh, airborne transmission. COVID is a virus. Malaria is a parasite. One works through blood constricting uh, the access to the, to the brain. <clears throat> the other deals in uh, respiratory uh, failure. So, I want, I want actually to see uh, Mr. Mueller in a box in front of his peers, not isolated in a room with a television set, putting on a, a show. I want to see him sweat. I want to watch his lawyer shifting his feet uncomfortably as some of this uh, uh, nonsense uh, comes out. I want to see the sort of coached uh, presentation that he's been given by his lawyer 
uh, disintegrate uh, under the, uh, the pressure that can only really be created uh, in an actual uh, hearing. You know, as Mike Tyson used to say, everybody's got a game plan until you get hit in the mouth. And it's when the witness gets hit in the mouth uh, that the fun begins, and you only see the fun if you're in the room. And what about uh, Ms. Huber? How is she going to explain her conflict of interest, working, uh, first of all, with uh, Ross to put together this uh, agreement that everybody's fighting over, and then she switches to the claimant, and she's busy upending the very agreement uh, she attempted to uh, negotiate. You know, these, these are uh, bombshell issues that will explode in a person-to-person -person hearing where everybody can see everybody else in the same time zone uh, as the hearing uh, progresses. Neil mentioned, well, it's midnight in uh, Melbourne, it's 8 o'clock in, uh, in Toronto. Uh, if we had somebody here from New Zealand, it would be 2 o'clock in the morning uh, in, uh, in Auckland. I don't know whether Neil is prepared to start a hearing at midnight uh, uh, in Melbourne. Uh, uh, and if he does and he's shaking his head, I expect he's not at his best. I would think Neil is probably better during normal circadian rhythms uh, than f forced into an arena at midnight to conduct a cross-examination that will go on for the next eight hours. Of course, Zoom hearings aren't eight hours because there's so many different time zones, there has to be a compromise. So the evidence gets in slowly uh, and disjointedly. Now, promote dispute resolution. Cases should settle. Clients want to settle. In this case, you've got a startup uh, uh, claimant. You've got a respondent who's in the business of patents and licensing technology to the very people like uh, the claimant. You've got an internal dispute over a, a contract. You've got a situation where the claimant doesn't, uh, and, and Ross don't want to sue each other. They want to settle. They've had negotiations. They've been unable to reach a deal. Where deals get reached is at the in-person hearing, over coffee, in the washroom, at the hotel breakfast, informal discussion. You know, will your people take three and a half million? <clears throat> I don't think so, but I might get them to four. All right. Uh, <clears throat> cases, cases start to settle. You don't have that on, on virtual uh, hearings. By definition, you're located all over the world and all you see each of each other is the, is the small screen. Now, I said that more things can go wrong in virtual hearings uh, than face to face. I've had two personal examples in the last month. There was a, a, a hearing involving a, a, an expert uh, uh, who was uh, uh, doing his uh, thing from, uh, from home. Uh, there were about 20 people on the line, various clients and so on and so forth, uh, the arbitrators, and there was an annoying dog somewhere. And I said, you know, would people please mute? And the witness said, well, I'm afraid the dog is in my house and my wife is out and I can't deal with it. So we proceeded with the dog yapping. We proceeded with the lawyer trying to ask questions. We proceeded with the uh, witness's focus, which was completely dissolved by this unexpected uh, uh, eventuality. You really feel like uh, saying to the dog and the witness, one at a time, please, you know, to try to gain some coherence out of the, uh, uh, the session. Uh, uh, but we labored through to the end with what I think was a much prejudiced uh, hearing. Then two nights ago, I had a hearing. There was a Lebanese expert testifying from Beirut, uh, and he was in the middle of explaining some intricacy of Lebanese uh, law of fiduciaries. Uh, and there was a commotion, and I said, what was the commotion? It was a riot outside his office. You know, the, the anti-government protests moving down the main streets in the evening, because it was evening in Beirut. So we continued, but, but these things happen. They don't happen all the time. Often virtual hearings uh, work uh, quite smoothly. The disadvantages are that you're missing the full experience of an in-person hearing, not that the technology uh, has a particular 
uh, uh, issue. So finally, about the uh, uh, profession. You know, the future is about you, uh, you know, the, the mooters, the people who've been denied the opportunity this year to go to Vienna to join people from all over the world to meet together, to talk, uh, to network, uh, and to have a, a wonderful uh, uh, time. You want to learn skills. You want to learn skills when you're young. You want to learn skills in courtrooms. That's where you, uh, or arbitration rooms, or you know, tribunal rooms. But, but you want to be on your feet and you want to experience uh, the whole uh, situation, not simply what can appear on the uh, small screen. I don't know whether these skills that lawyers have picked up uh, you know, over the years uh, can be handed down to younger lawyers who've never seen anything other uh, than a hearing on uh, Zoom. I don't think you have the same energy. I don't think you have the same uh, uh, tension. I don't think you learn as quickly without that kind of pressure. The pressure is really what forces uh, a hearing to focus and to bring out uh, uh, the truth. So I think it would be a, an enormous error if the legal profession were to pivot because, uh, you know, the cost of flying Mr. Kaplan from Melbourne to Vienna is more expensive than a Zoom line to allow that kind of co concern to determine uh, the future. A couple of hours of Mr. Kaplan's time will pay for his airfare uh, from Melbourne to uh, 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 Vienna. Uh, and overall, in the scheme of things, these costs are not uh, prohibitive, they're not great. If there is a 20% advantage in getting at the truth of a hearing, in getting the issues out on the table, who un to understanding the credibility of witnesses, only a 20% margin in an in-person hearing over in a virtual hearing, that is the 20% uh, that lawyers and arbitrators are interested in. That's the 20% that determines uh, cases. Uh, and uh, on that basis, I would oppose any idea that this House prefers, prefers uh, virtual hearings regardless of the circumstances. Thank you. Uh, before your rebuttals, I want to pose two questions I hope you would address naturally anyway in your rebuttals. The first is I want to press you to say what is the overriding factor in favor of the motion and against the motion? The overriding factor. This is just what a tribunal might ask you or ask the mooters. Second, neither of you mentioned a topic that has come up in discussions about virtual hearings, which is the uh, bias, most likely an unconscious bias, that comes up when tribunal members have past personal familiarity with other members of the tribunal or council from real life, from, from that in the room experience that you've just heard about from from each that we've just heard about from each of you, uh, when you've got someone you know very well already and trust very well from real life and on the screen, there are others whom you don't know except in two dimensions. Is that something that would sway your support for or against the motion? Over to you, Neil, for your rebuttal, five minutes. All right, thank you very much. Um, well, I thought it was a great shame that Ian didn't really get to grips with the main point that I was making. I, I wasn't saying there should never be um, a, a full hearings. He didn't get to grips with all the other hearings that there are that don't require witnesses during the course of an arbitration. And some of these uh, hearings are extremely important and they're very expensive. Uh, because they involve a lot of uh, people and law and getting together if you have to travel. And, and, and so um, you can't just say, uh, I prefer the, or the main hearing to be um, in person because it's good for young lawyers and it's good for everyone to get together and have a drink and it's good for people to go to the loo and try and settle the cases. It doesn't work like that anymore, I'm afraid. The costs are far too high the amounts at stake are far too high in most of the cases that we're talking about. Um, 
let me just say this about young lawyers. Young lawyers will still cut their teeth on domestic cases. There will be domestic cases in, in, in state courts. There will be domestic arbitrations where they can go uh, in their own uh, city and cut their, uh, uh, learn their skills. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, um, I think Ian completely underestimates the cost. Uh, I've been doing this now for over a quarter of a century, and I've been through a number of bills, and I can see what a huge amount of money is spent uh, by, by having to travel many times all the way around the world. I'm sorry that Ian was disconcerted by the dog barking, and I can understand how irritating that was. On the other hand, he could have easily been sitting in arbitration place while the next door building was doing some very heavy work and drilling and uh, interrupting him in that way. So I don't think that's a very strong point, if I may say so. I agree things can go wrong. Uh, you started off by talking about the Vienna moot. I never said the Vienna moot should be virtual. I can't wait for the Vienna moot to be real. Uh, I want to be there. I want to be in the opening session. I want to be at the opera and uh, at the concert halls and to meet with all the students as I've done over many years. Of course, that will go back to normal when it can. But I think we have to be realistic about whether most of the stages in arbitration can genuinely, gen genuinely justify flying halfway around the world for a half a day meeting in the Japanese room or somewhere else. Lucy, the overriding factor. I mean, the overriding factor must be convenience. Um, it's, it's a wide word, I accept. And that includes looking at the cost and looking at whether uh, all the expense is justified for the hearing. Um, there will be cases where it is important to have a face-to-face -face hearing where there are serious uh, issues of credibility. My experience is there are not that many cases around that turn on credibility. Uh, Lucy has uh, herself written about the dangers of witness recollection, and so has Toby Landau, and their comments are well-founded. So most of the cases I do do not turn on witness recollection. Uh, and if there is a case which really depends on who's telling a, the truth about this or that, I, I accept uh, Ian's point, but there are not that many cases around. On the question of bias, I don't think that's a fair point. It is true there will be people on the other end of the screen who you know, and there will be people on the other end of the screen who you don't know. I mean, that happens in real life. I don't think that matters. I mean, if you're a fair-minded, independent arbitrator, you're only concerned at the merits of what's being said not who's saying it. So I, I'm not particularly uh, worried about that point. So I think that um, the idea that you can fly a whole team of people halfway around the world for a short meeting that's not the final hearing, I think is something that we won't countenance. And uh, there will always be exceptions. There may be a hearing that is so important that they want everybody to be there and they're prepared to pay for it. So be it. But in most cases, we have to consider uh, time, cost, and wear and tear on the body and the planet. I noticed that the end didn't mention a word about the great advantages environmentally of not flying everywhere all the time. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Uh, Ian, your rebuttal, five minutes, please. Yes, well, I, uh, the uh, uh, first point that uh, you raise as to what is the uh, uh, major point against uh, the uh, 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 virtual hearing, it is uh, what well, was the first point on my list, which is the uh, advantage that it has in, in getting uh, at the truth because you're operating uh, well, uh, uh, considered well worked uh, uh, machinery in an in person. Uh, uh, environment uh, with all the advantages that I was uh, uh, discussing. I think, uh, you know, on this unconscious uh, uh, bias, uh, it's an issue that uh, is across uh, the board. 
to some extent, uh, these organizations uh, like the uh, World Bank and uh, uh, the LCIA have <coughs> conferences and meetings and networks. Uh, those aren't hearings, those are opportunities. Uh, Neil says he'd love to fly to Vienna as soon as he's allowed to for the Viz moot. Well, it rather undermines this, uh, the virtues of a virtual hearing, which is the way today's, uh, this uh, uh, present moot is going to occur. If he wants to abandon the virtual hearing and get to Vienna as fast as Qantas uh, uh, can get him there. Uh, what he's really trying to do is to say, well, when the motion says a preference uh, hearing prefers virtual hearings, he says, well, what about the, the little motion, the, the half-day motion? Why would you fly everybody across the world for that? Well, you don't. Uh, but his motion doesn't say uh, this House prefers uh, virtual hearings, uh, not, uh, but, you know, for small business, but retains in-person hearings for uh, matters uh, on merits where possible. That's really the position he kind of wound up at. Uh, and I think that the, uh, it, it, is a, it, is, it is not really what this motion is about. This motion says, you know, the heart of the process is the hearing on the merits. He wants the hearing on the merits to be uh, virtual. I think that anybody listening to this debate stuck in your kitchen, in your bed, city, deprived of your trip to Vienna, considering your own future uh, in, the profession, in the profession, you know, can hardly reach the conclusion uh, that it is pre preferable to isolate yourself uh, from where the real action occurs uh, in a hearing room uh, and live your life uh, on the small screen. I, I'm sure that the majority of people watching this are not small screen people. They are large stage people who have grand ambitions and you don't realize grand ambitions on a small screen. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our debate. So now, my friends at Arbitration Place, shall we poll our listeners again? The first poll was 61% in favor of traditional, preferring traditional hearings. Okay. And then after listening to our noted advocates, what was the second result? Oh, gosh, I, <laughs> well, I think that, um, I think that both of our debaters did very well. And I suspect that Ian's approach to our audience, which is wouldn't you rather be in Vienna than sitting in your bedsit, had an impact, Neil, don't, don't feel bad on the change, uh, on the change of the votes. But let's have, we have a few extra minutes. So let's um, talk to each other as if we were in a breakout room. Um, few no comments. Questions. No. Are we are we live with the audience or not? Yes, as far as I know, so, yes. So Neil, any, your perception. Any questions, any questions from the audience? Can we do that? Can we invite questions, Kim and and others? Uh, the audience did not pose any questions. Uh, okay. If they would like to, they can use the raise hand function, and we can give them permission to speak. Okay. So if anyone in the audience wants to to ask a question, use that function and we will. I would just like to comment that one of the things we didn't touch upon and it wasn't part of the debate, so that's understandable, is the, the fact that I think in future we will have hybrid hearings. One of the benefits of virtual hearings, including the final hearing, which is what um, Ian focused on, is that there can be more participants, younger lawyers, supporting lawyers, people from far away who couldn't afford to come before. So we may well see that except in the handful of hearings where credibility is so important and the amounts and the witnesses are so important that there can be live streaming participation 
by other members of teams in a hearing. Another hybrid would be any witness who's going to be questioned just for an hour or a few hours will come in on screen rather than fly halfway around the world and, and ruin so many trees. So we'll see more flexibility and creativity on the part of tribunals and arbitration place type institutions to get the best of both worlds, real people in one room and, and virtual. Um, and I'm looking forward to that. You know, uh, unless we get um, passports after vaccination, there's still going to be a terrible trouble about quarantine in many places around the world. It's going to make travel very difficult. So we're going to have to live with this for quite a long time. The longer we live with it, the more we'll get used to it. And for our students, you may not realize that a quality of arms means that even if one team or, or one set of witnesses could attend in person and the other one can't, that means nobody uh, will be able to attend in person, I expect. Uh, we'll have quite a period of, of adjustment. Ian, what would you like to say uh, overall? You know, it is, it is correct that we're going to be living with this for a long time. My, uh, my, my, I have a real concern about you know, international <coughs> arbitration. I think uh, the costs are way out of line. Uh, domestic litigation advances much more efficiently, many fewer lawyers. Uh, it's become a kind of a cash cow, and I think it has to be reined in. So it's a very large issue. Uh, I don't think uh, this uh, uh, motion addressed it. On the, 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 uh, the extension, lawyer skills in international arbitration vary enormously. I think there's a huge deficit in the ability of young lawyers specializing in arbitration to cross-examine. They really don't understand how to put a question to their own witness if there's a short introduction, and they essentially cross-examine by reading bits of the transcript or a report to the witness and asking them to uh, uh, agree with it. I think there's a huge training deficit amongst uh, uh, the international uh, arbitration bar, and uh, it, 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 it's something that, it's another problem that should be addressed. Uh, seriously by those uh, 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 practitioners. Uh, it should be, a, uh, you know, the pinnacle of international arbitration, uh, uh, you know, not, not, not a place where you can uh, pad your bank account. And hence the importance of the moot for training. We do have a question from Laurence Marquis, which is uh, to say, what do you two think of segmenting hearings and holding the main hearing in discrete thematic segments over a longer period, perhaps some in person, some not in person. Are you in, in favor of that given, especially your experience as judges and arbitrators? First, uh, Ian, since you're up. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm not <clears throat> in favor. I think uh, cases move when, they're, when the pressure is on and uh, it, it, <clears throat> if, if you have these uh, hearings, you know, one week here, one week there, one week the next where, uh, it, it's, a, it's a curse of the courts. Uh, people lose track of, of where they are. Uh, the focus is lost because you've done a lot of things in between the segments that uh, 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 are, are being held. Uh, and, and, it, it's, it, and the settlement uh, pressure is off. So I think it's a bad idea. Sometimes it has to be, there's no choice, but it's a bad idea. Neil? I think it, what, what segmentation you're talking about, I'm certainly, in I think we can use uh, virtual hearings better to, to take off things like jurisdiction, raise charge, time bars, things like that. If we can find a discrete point of law, uh, then that's quite a useful way of dealing with it without all gathering in one place. One thing no one's mentioned is asynchronous, asynchronous hearings, which is where, for instance, the opening by one side is given orally, it's recorded. And so you, the tribunal, and the other side watch it in your own comfortable time zone on the video. And then you do it the other way around. So you've saved a couple of days, maybe, of having to get up early or travel. Uh, and then you you can build on this for other parts of the case. It's used quite often in China in one of their uh, IP courts, I think, and Michael Huang has written about this. It, I'm not sure, but it, it's worth looking at for some aspects of the case. 
I agree, unless you're an arbitrator who likes to interrupt openings, um, which many of us are. Two questions to end with, um, maybe three. The, the first is, should we begin to set a minimum standard of tech savvy skills required by our arbitrators? Uh, is this a new competence for training? That's one question for both of you. And then for Neil, uh, have you actually observed an increase in the number of short virtual hearings that take place, for example, for openings, closings, applications um, that you think will continue? Yes, the answer to the last question is definitely. And you think uh, that will continue, I, I expect? I think so. I mean, I mean and unless we're all in the same city or London, Paris, you can jump on the train. But if it's flying, even four hours, uh, yeah, I think we will do that, definitely. What was the other question? The other uh, part of tech that? savvy testing, basically, for arbitrators. I, I think that you've got to be patient on that score because as the older people sort of drop off the end, the younger people coming up will be te more tech savvy. Um, of course, this is one of the advantages of having an arbitral secretary because they can help you very much with this. And of course, it is, it is quite difficult for some of the older people to handle electronic documents. And many of my colleagues now only work in electronic documents. You probably do. do, do, do. That's right. Uh, I try to, but I do like to mark up sometimes. But I guess, Ian, you probably like hard copies as well? I do like uh, hard copies. <clears throat> and I've, my experience both in, uh, in courts and in arbitrations is that, you know, arbitrators tend to know uh, a little bit and have overconfidence in their ability to deal with uh, uh, tech. Uh, a lot of hearings uh, are interrupted uh, when the arbitrators press the wrong button on something or other and the system is crashed or he can't find a document. So uh, they should be tech savvy in order to prepare the case, but I'm far happier with the actual hearing and its technical aspects being placed in the hands of somebody else so the arbitrators can focus on the argument. Can I just say this, that the providers now, of the electronic book, do all that help for you and they train you and they get the documents up. So I think, you know, it's working okay. We can manage, even though we may not be skilled. There's always someone there in the background just pick something that goes wrong. Two last questions, which will give you a chance to each in 30 seconds wrap up um, your views. One is, what have you found works or might work to substitute for the bonding that takes place for a tribunal when you can be together in real person? What, what happens in two-dimensional life to substitute for that, if anything? And the second, um, goes to Mr. Uh, Neil's response to Ian's comments about settlements, prospects, possibilities being hurt when everyone's just online. Are there any, until the pandemic's over and before the next one starts, are there anything tribunals can do to, to correct for that difference in our two-dimensional world? So 30 seconds each. I think on the last point that um, uh, the fact that there was going to be and had to be if there was going to be a hearing, a virtual one, has led to many settlements, funnily enough. I still don't understand why uh, solicitors can't get on the phone, or attorneys can't get on the phone and have a, a Zoom call with their opposite number and discuss it, just as if they were doing it in the pub or, or, or on the way to the toilet. Um, but um, what was the first point that was, um, can't read my writing. Uh, Bonding. How do arbitrators get along now? Well, I mean, it depends. If you know them already well, then it's quite easy. You have Zoom meetings whenever you want. I agree, it's much better to be in the same room to deliberate, but it can be done uh, on Zoom if you know them well. If you don't know them well, or one of them well, then it is more of a problem, I expect. And uh, there's nothing like the, uh, the body language that you can't always get on the screen. Uh, but I'm fortunate, I tend to work with people I know, so it's not a problem. Ian, your last words, please. Yes, I think uh, they're difficult to find uh, substitutes for bonding in a, a pandemic uh, era. Uh, Neil said earlier that as soon as the Vienna, uh, uh, this moot was uh, restored, he'd be flashing off to Vienna, uh, leaving virtual, uh, virtuality uh, behind. 
Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, there will be all the attendant costs and carbon footprints and all the rest of it, uh, but the world is not going to remain in the basement. The world is going to come uh, back together. Uh, and I think until that time, there will be a deficiency uh, in getting on the same length and getting familiar with and trusting uh, uh, other colleagues and uh, uh, opposing uh, lawyers. Uh, on the question of uh, settlement, uh, I think uh, a lot of cases settle because people are terrified of the process. Uh, they may not have had much experience uh, with a virtual hearing. They understand that there won't be face-to-face uh, -face, uh, confrontation. You know, it's, it's like in court when a case is assigned to a judge that nobody uh, has great trust in. There's a very high rate of settlement. You know, you've got to get out of there with what you can. So uh, I'm not surprised at the settlement uh, figure. Okay, I want to thank uh, Kim and Raven and Eric and everyone at Arbitration Place on behalf of Neil and Ian and I um, for holding this debate. It's, it's been fun preparing and it's been fun doing and all of us wish you, you Vis Moody's, uh, a successful uh, preliminary round there at Arbitration Place uh, and onward. I want to begin by introducing Dr. Gary Gennard, who is an actor, author, and speech coach. He uses performance techniques to help business executives, teams, and professionals embody presence and confidence to achieve true influence. Since 2001, he has consulted for various corporations, governments, and individuals worldwide, including IBM, McKinsey & Co., the United Nations, and the U.S. State Department and Congress. Dr. Gennard's weekly blog, Speak for Success, covers topics ranging from leadership communication to, to overcoming fear of public speaking, body language, voice improvement, and influencing stakeholders. He is the author of How to Give a Speech and Fearless Speaking, Be Your Anxiety, Build Your Confidence, Change Your Life, and has also published hundreds of articles on effective public speaking. Dr. Gennard holds a PhD in theater from Tufts University in Massachusetts, and has served on the faculty at Harvard, Boston College, Tufts, Bentley University, and the University of Illinois. For the past year, Dr. Gennard has focused on communicating in the video environment. His latest book is The Online Meetings Handbook. In his words, we're all virtual now. That means we're tasked with creating a virtual persona to match our in-person ability to speak with impact and influence. His training program, Speak at Your Best, was named in 2020 as one of the top 10 communication training programs in the world. He remains dedicated to inspiring people from all walks of life to discover the power of their own voice and reach their full potential as communicators. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Gennard. Thank you, Eric. And hello, everybody, and welcome to our workshop on improving your virtual presence. It's an honor for me to be uh, associated with Arbitration Place in their pre vis -moot competition and I congratulate you for this, um, this honor that you're participating in. I'm sure it's, you're all very excited about this. And uh, we're gonna talk today for um, about uh, 40 minutes on this topic of improving your virtual presence. Uh, we're gonna discuss a number of specific areas. I'm going to discuss performance techniques, how all good public speaking is conversational, Personalizing a webcam, very important skill to, um, to improve on when you're speaking virtually as we all are now. Vocal skills and why they are such an essential element of your um, being able to persuade people and make your points well. And finally, body language. And what does body language mean in terms of this, the, uh, the visual age, the virtual age that we're all in now? So I imagine, just like everybody else, you've been uh, dealing in a topsy-turvy world over the past year, as we've all uh, tried to figure out how to work virtually and how to come across at our best when we're in the virtual environment. So what does that mean? I think it's, uh, it's uh, the first thing that is important for us to answer is, what does virtual presence mean? That's a word you've probably heard a lot in terms of executive presence, stage presence, or just the word presence. And what does it mean? Sometimes I think we, 
aim for the wrong goal and try to impress people by how we appear before them instead of aiming for the truth of what we're trying to do. My background, as you've just heard, is as an actor. And uh, I talk a lot about the meeting places between the performance world of acting and the performance world of public speaking. But one of the core things that I talk about and one of the core elements of being an effective communicator is that you speak from a place of truth and not artifice, not trying to be good, not trying to create a good performance, but dealing with the truth of what you're talking about moment by moment as it unfolds. And I'll go into that a little bit more, but it also has bearing in this idea of what presence is. So I think before we can talk about virtual presence, I, th I think it's necessary to talk about what presence means. And it tends to be mysterious in people's minds, but it's not so complicated. And I think it's worth remembering that the word presence and the word present come from the same Latin root, which means that if you're present in a speaking situation, you'll probably be hitting on all cylinders and you'll probably be achieving that trust and honesty that we need, not by trying to do so, but by basically being who you are and just trying to come through at, at your best. I don't know that it differs so much in terms of virtual presence versus um, in-person presence, except of course, the fact that you're speaking on a screen and that you're talking to a video camera or webcam. And um, we'll talk more about that and how to do well in that particular skill and how to get better at it and to come through even more as yourself, which is of course what we always want to do when we speak to people and try to persuade them and get them to think, feel, or do what we would like them to. And if things are as they should be, it's a win-win situation so that we all benefit from that. So what does this word presence mean? I'd like to quote from one of my books in which I say, the exceptional speaker creates something unique and valuable within the dictates of the medium, like a poet in a sonnet or a haiku. You know, when you write your own book, maybe you already have, but when you do, when a few years go by, someone might read you something and you might say, that's good, who wrote that? And they'll say, you did. <laughs> so it's you know, a little bit surprising to think, oh, I wrote that, well, that's, uh, I like that. Uh, but this idea of being creative within the form that you have to speak within. And of course, if you are an advocate and if you are, um, if you're speaking in court or you're speaking uh, in any, uh, any endeavor related to the law where advocacy is concerned, then you do have to speak within that particular medium. And the way that you do it and do it effectively is part of what can make you an exciting speaker and, uh, and even a memorable one. So the idea of a um, performing in public is should always be uppermost in your mind. There's a story of a young lawyer who worked for a large law firm whose client was a manufacturer. And the, uh, the law firm had the young lawyer at the law firm had come up with a novel interpretation of a, of a safety act that had been in place for some time. And they intended to argue this in court on behalf of their client. So the in-house attorney at the manufacturer invited the young attorney and his mentor, the older gentleman at the firm to come into his office and to present their case to them. And when they got there, the, uh, the in-house attorney said to the young attorney, okay, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm the appellate court, and I want you to give me your argument and tell me why we should change this safety procedure, this safety act that's been in place for a long time and no one's had any problem with it. Well, with that as the invitation, the young attorney was flustered, didn't really, he tried to get through the argument, it didn't do a very good job, and it didn't go well. So uh, on the way back, driving back to the office, the, the mentor turned to the young attorney and said, you know, you just learned a very valuable lesson that most attorneys never learn. And that is that as a, as a lawyer, 
you are a professional speaker. Every time you speak as a lawyer, you're speaking professionally. And so it's a critically important area that you need to do well anytime it's asked and to, in essence, perform as a public, as a professional speaker with perform. And I think that's a good lesson for all of us to learn if we're speaking professionally. Um, there is actually a, a, a well-known book published a few decades ago now, but it's called the, the Presentation of Self in Everyday Life. And I don't know if you've ever heard the phrase, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, but that means that we give performances day in and day out uh, as human beings. And we do it effortlessly and easily and without a second thought because we respond to the people and the situation that we're in in a way that we think is appropriate for that situation. Sometimes when it comes to giving formal speeches and appearing in what we consider public, then we see it as something different, something much bigger, something that takes a tremendous amount of talent that we're not sure we have, a huge amount of experience. And we're all, of course, exposed to that feeling of vulnerability and exposure. And so we think, I can't give this type of performance. But the truth is, we're performing every day. And the more we can understand that, the more we realize that this is just another one. However important the argument you're making, whichever tribunal or arbitrators you're making it in front of, it's just another opportunity for you to perform as you do so well and so successfully in your personal life. So I think that's something that uh, is well worth bearing in mind for all of us. You know, uh, one of the things I want to say today is that uh, Eric mentioned it briefly, but as uh, we go through this discussion, we welcome any questions that you might have at any point, especially after I uh, talk about any particular segment of um, this webinar. Uh, feel free to raise your hand and ask a question. And if you're called upon, then we would ask you please to activate your cameras so we can see you asking the question. And um, we would like that because it would make it more of a conversation. And uh, that's actually my next point in, is that all good public speaking is conversational. Uh, it used to be that in the 19th century to the 20th, 20th century, we had orators, especially in politics, but in other areas as well, who would get up on stage and as I say, poke a hole in the air with their finger and orate. And uh, there were even poses that they had to take and uh, certain vocal skills that were expected. Um, you may see old silent movies where when the heroine is in distress, she does this. So that's an indication that I'm supposed to be in distress. Well, we've come a long way since then in terms of realism. And today, every good speaker sounds like he or she is simply having a conversation with everybody else, whether you see them on stage or whether you're having coffee in a cafe with them, they sound like themselves. And again, that's where that sense of honesty and truthfulness in the performances that we give every day comes, comes in. Now, we're all virtual. We have to be. This won't last forever, but for now, it's the essential way to speak. And so we know we have to be good at it. So I'd like to call up the first poll question now, which deals with this issue. All right, you can see there are four questions there asking you, what do you think your most important asset is when speaking virtually? But don't worry, I plan to give you uh, at least what I consider my answer. So we'll see which, uh, how this uh, stacks up in terms of the skill that you think is most important in this particular application of reaching, persuading, and advocating for your, um, your side. And I imagine that we'll see our results right here. 
it looks like everybody chose number two. Well, that's the reason you all are participating in Arbitration Place's pre vismut competition, because that's exactly the right answer. Um, sometimes you have experienced this, maybe you've been guilty of it yourself, we all have, trying to get all the information in so we speak faster and cram it in. And of course, that really doesn't sink in with everybody. We need to pace our presentations. Um, having a powerful voice, of course, is good. If you happen to have a talent to hypnotize people, well, I won't say any more about that. But uh, that is the correct answer, ability to connect with viewers through the webcam. Thank you, Eric. So how do we do that? I mean, it's one thing to say, oh, I would like to come through much more effectively with a, with a webcam than just looking like I am frozen in place. I'm stiff like this and I don't like staring at a camera and I know no one is in the room with me and I'm not sure if anybody is out there. So I'll do the best I can and hope for the best. Well, you can see how stiff I got, how my eye contact looked artificial, how my voice was affected and how every aspect of how I came across was not natural. And in fact, was reinforcing the fact that this is a mediated conversation and not just something that we try to simulate as much as possible, a conversation between two people as though they were within the same space. So how do we do that? Many people are not comfortable talking to a camera. And it's easy to understand why, because um, there is no one there. We assume that there are people there and sometimes we see them in gallery view or the different views that we set up on our screen. But don't forget that in the vast majority of cases, the person that you're speaking to or the people that you're speaking to is or are the camera we often make the mistake of looking at the person. Now I'm looking at my screen and it, it probably looks to you like I'm looking down, even though I would be looking at the person that I'm talking to. But in order for me to look like I'm looking at you, I need to do this and I need to uh, stare at the screen and uh, actually talk to the screen. And so some of my clients and trainees say, well, how can I do that? I wanna be looking at the people and I say, you know, it's just an artifact of this virtual communication that's still pretty new for most of us, at least in terms of using it this much to this effect. So we just have to develop the habit of making our eye contact, eye contact with that camera so that it looks like we're talking to the people. We can notice out of the corner of our eye some of the movement that one person is doing on screen if we use the speaker screen. But if there are many people, we just have to accept that this is something we have to let go of in terms of virtual versus in-person speaking and make the camera the person we have the relationship with. So that is difficult for people because it's not easy to, to um, relate to a camera or a microphone as opposed to a human being. So what's the trick of doing this? Well, I have one and it's this. The best thing you can do is to imagine that the camera in this case is someone whose opinion you care deeply about. Some person who's intelligent, who knows the work you do, who's discerning and, that, and who knows you and that you would like to pat you on the back afterwards and say, hey, that was great. You did a great job. I'm proud of you. Knowing in your mind that this is a person who understands what went into this presentation or speech or remarks or whatever it is, and that you really do appreciate hearing that from this person. And also, even better, choose someone that you know wouldn't say that unless they really meant it. So that when you speak, this becomes you speaking to someone that you do have a relationship with rather than a cold piece of machinery. And that means that you will start to come through in all of the aspects that make you who you are, your personality, your eye contact, your facial expressions, 
um, the, the way you hold yourself, the way you relate to the person you're talking to, which in this case is that is personified by that camera. So if you do this, you will come across much better generally and much more like yourself. And the interesting thing is that you will not lose any of the vital information that you brought into this interaction that you know about anyway, and that you're fully prepared to deliver, but you'll be able to do it in a way that's personable, likable, human, uh, powerful, assertive, professional, without the feeling intruding from the viewer or viewers that you're speaking artificially and you're not quite comfortable doing it. So are there any questions about that or about anything we've covered so far? I'd um, be very happy to answer any questions anybody has about the things that I've talked about up to, up to this point. So we currently have one question in the Q&A. And this is from Barry Leon. He asks, when you're speaking to an arbitral tribunal or a judge, you want to watch their reactions. How can you meld that with looking at the camera? Is it by looking away just a bit? Ah, good question. And of course, uh, highly relevant to this group and, uh, and, and the competition. Uh, I think it's a balancing act. First of all, the most important time to look at the camera is when you are making a point because a um, looking people in the eye, at least in the Western tradition, means to be making contact with them, eye to eye, person to person, as you make the important point like I'm making right now, as I'm talking to you right now. If there are times when you could pause, when you are pausing, you could sneak a look at the arbitrator on the screen to see how that person is responding. You'll also be able to see out of the corner of your eye if he or she is doing this or going like this or you know, doing something that they, they, they want to interrupt. If their responses are important enough for you, you can sneak very short periods of time when you look away from the camera as I'm doing now, and then I go right back to the camera and you could sneak a quick, a quick look there. But finally, I would say that we probably shouldn't base our understanding of how someone is perceiving us and thinking about us based solely on what they're showing in terms of body language. Uh, this, is, this is well known with uh, courtroom attorneys, attorneys who do a lot of jury trials. Uh, and it's, uh, it's said to be very dangerous to watch the jury come back from deliberations and decide you know how they're going to think because of what they're showing you in terms of body language and they're either going to vote for you or vote against you or for that matter during the trial because there are people who will sit in the jury and every point you make is like this and you think, oh, that's great. She agrees with me totally. And then the other side gets up uh, and, and starts across and they're talking to that person and that person's going like this just exactly in the same way. So uh, it's it's, I don't think that we should base our um, our belief in whether a person is agreeing with us or disagreeing with us just by paying that much attention to their body language. Part of the problem, of course, if we do that is because we can be either discouraged because we think the body language is negative or we can be encouraged because the body language is positive. But the truth about body language is, and I'll talk about body language a little bit later, but the truth about it is that one thing that you see doesn't indicate much of anything at all. You have to look at the whole pattern of body language that you're being shown or vocal rhythms or ways of speaking that you're hearing in, in the totality of the situation. And when it changes in some way, when someone starts to speak differently or exhibits different body language, then this may be significant, maybe. And this is something that customs agents uh, and uh, police interrogators and cross-examining attorneys know. And it just often can be a red flag in terms of letting you know, let me probe a little bit more in this area, or let me strengthen this argument a little bit because something may be going on here, but even then it's a risk to base 
uh, perception on what a person is thinking or feeling just because they're doing something physically. And of course, when people are in situations where they're nervous, like appearing in court as a witness um, or a defendant or at a deposition or even, um, even advocating in an ar arbitration, then they're not they're not totally confident. They do feel vulnerable. They do feel like this is a situation where they have to do good and they're not completely uh, confident in doing so. So even there, they may be exhibiting behavior and uh, FBI agents know this, uh, where they'll bring someone in and question them and the person looks like they're guilty, but they're fidgeting or they're not looking the person in the eye, not because they're guilty, but because they're very uncomfortable and scared. So I hope that answers that question. We have a couple more questions as well. Yes. Uh, one of them is about positioning of the camera. Uh, so what's the optimal place to put it? Uh, above the top of your screen, somewhere behind it. What's your recommendation? It's very important. Thank you for that question. It's very important in terms of the logistics of your speaking um, venue, your speaking situation, virtual now. Uh, the camera should indeed be at eye height. I use, uh, I, I have a MacBook and I use a laptop stand with it. So it's at just the right height and I position it away and then I move the screen forward or backwards. So what you're seeing is just, a, just about the top of my head, a little bit more than the top of my head and down to here. So I can gesture like this. Uh, and uh, of course, many people make the mistake of putting the laptop, uh, if it's a laptop or even a phone, too low on their desk and they're looking down at it, which means we're looking up their nostrils and uh, the light is never flattering if, if, you're, if you're being lit from underneath. So the second area is lighting and uh, you can see here that I'm well lit and you can see some of the color of my face, I believe. And that's because I have a, a lamp that's situated about uh, 12 to 18 inches above my head and it's turned on facing me so that I don't become a silhouette with the light behind me. And um, it illuminates you as speaker and gives you some flesh tones. And the interesting thing is you don't need to spend a lot of money on this. You don't need to get high, expensive video equipment and lighting um, umbrellas and things like that. Uh, just a, a, an incandescent bulb, a 60 watt or 100 watt incandescent bulb will do it. That's all the light you need. I also have two, uh, three windows facing me here. So there's some natural light here too. And it's, uh, it's mid afternoon here in Boston. So there's light coming in there too. But, but the two determinants are camera angle. So it looks like it's eyesight. And incidentally, the, um, the, the camera should be something like about 22 inches away from you. And lighting is the other element. Okay, we have uh, two more questions, if that's all right. That's absolutely fine. The next one is, what was the most difficult challenge you faced from the transition uh, from face to face to virtual in terms of communication stuff? Well, I'm not sure I faced the challenge because as an actor, I've done camera work as well as stage work. So I'm used to staring at a lens that's lit to tell me that's the camera that's on. Uh, although I did have to develop the, the uh, to remind myself as it were, that I really shouldn't look away from that camera to look at the person because like everybody else, I would like to look at the person I'm speaking to, but I had to sort of retrain myself to um, to look at the camera. I don't, I don't have the issue that many people talk about, which is Zoom fatigue, because they've done many meetings uh, day, day in and day out. They're always doing meetings. To me, when I connect with someone and I can see that person on a screen who is only 22 inches away from me or so, so I don't know what it is in metrics for those of you who are you know, use the metric system, but it's very close. So, so one of the interesting um, artifacts of virtual speaking is that the person is actually as close to you as they would be in a conversation, sometimes slightly closer, so that we do not have to overcome the obstacle of being on a stage 
or um, say a large hotel conference room, speaking to people who may be 15, 20, 30, 40 feet away from us, where we really have to project ourselves, even if we have a lapel microphone, that only projects our voice. We have to project our persona out, our physical self. So it's an effort to do that. And with virtual speaking, it's just almost as though the person were right here with you and we're looking at each other face to face. So I encourage you to see that not as a limitation, but as a way to be close, literally close to someone. It's one of the interesting paradoxes of the virtual environment that we are in a sense closer to people, even though we're much farther apart than we ever were. Thousands of miles becomes 22 inches or so. Okay, and then the last question is, would you recommend turning off um, your own screen while talking so that you can focus on looking at others and not yourself? No. I think it's important that other people can see you. I think when people turn off their screen, they, uh, they create an environment for the speaker which seems like they're in the blackness of space and there's nobody out there. I know that some, some companies have that as a policy that they ask everybody to turn off their, uh, their cameras so that people won't be distracted. I don't think it's a good policy. I think that people should keep their cameras on. Um, you asked, is it a good idea to turn, what was this, the other part of that question? Yeah, let, let me just clarify. I think it's their meaning in terms of self view. So like for example- Oh, yes, yes. Yes, don't look at yourself, but you, you needn't turn off your camera to follow that dictate. My camera is on, I, I can see myself out of the corner of my eye, but I'm not looking at myself. Uh, you, you can hide yourself, there's, a, there's a, um, a button on Zoom where you can actually hide yourself so, so that you're not looking at yourself. I think it's a bad idea to look at yourself because you'll be uh, concerned with yourself. I work with a lot of people who have anxiety over speaking and, uh, and a high level of self-consciousness. And interestingly, there is a whole group of people who before March 2020 didn't really have an issue with this. Um, they were able to speak in person fine. They didn't come to me for fear of public speaking as, as, as many people do. But in the virtual era, they are uncomfortable speaking virtually. and. One, one reason can be that they are looking at themselves because they have that opportunity, which you never had before if you were speaking at a conference room or speaking on a panel or at a conference. So now we have the luxury, if we want, of, uh, of looking at ourselves while we're talking. But I, I always think it's a bad idea because the reason that we speak and the whole essence of the speaking situation is for us to direct our energy outward and try to connect with and influence positive people positively and have a positive impact on others. And the more time we spend focusing on ourselves and thinking of ourselves and worrying how we're doing, then we are in fact directing the energy inward where it doesn't do any good because we're not here to impress ourselves or to convince ourselves. So we should always turn the energy outward toward the audience. And in fact, I call that, and it just really doesn't only have to do with virtual speaking at all. I call it living in the audience's world because we tend to be speaker centric. It's just a human condition. We want to do well. We want to understand that we're doing well. We like to be patted on the back and so on. But the more speaker centric we are, the less we are focused on the audience and how they're receiving and perceiving what we're saying. So I, I, I advocate what I call living in the audience's world. And not only when you're performing, but from the very first moment that you start to think about what you're going to say when you're asked to speak. Because most of us make the mistake of thinking of our topic first. But the truth is, the very first thing we should think about is our audience. If we don't know the audience, then we do an audience analysis. I was asked by the Flashner Judicial Institute to give a workshop for judges on listening skills. And I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a judge. So I immediately contacted them and said, can I talk to 
some lawyers, some judges, who can tell me what a judge needs in terms of improving his or her communication skills, listening skills specifically. And they gave me the names of three people and I was able to talk to the judge who actually later became the, the, um, the chief justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court. And I was in his chambers when he was holding a uh, trial and he, his clerk kept saying, are you ready judge? And he'd say, no, 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 no. I have to talk. I have to make this point. And so it was, it was nice. You know, he was, he was giving me all his time um, because I didn't know the audience. So I strongly advocate doing an audience analysis. Sometimes it might be your team you're working with or some people you're familiar with, so you don't have to do a formal analysis. But the topic that you're dealing with on this particular day may be in, uh, different from what you've done in the past. So we should always think, what, who are these people? What is going to resonate with them? How can I live in their world? So everything I say is based on my need and my effort to get this thing that I'm speaking across to them in a way that will resonate with them, that will engage them, because this is who they are and this is the world they live in. And as we think of the different cultures we talk to and the different demographics of audiences, we understand that this is a critically important part of speech preparation because it helps us decide which material to bring in, which stories, which case studies, which data, which past experiences, which cultural references will resonate with one audience versus the other. We tend to land right on our material and go in there just armed and ready to deliver our content and think, don't get in my way audience. I've got to get through these 45 slides today and I only have 20 minutes to do it. So we are really intent. We have a great relationship with our content. We have no relationship with the people who are listening to us and who are in fact, the reason we're there. So living in the audience's world, as I always think the, it is the way to go. And for one, among other things, that means let's not look at ourselves. Let's, and let's not even look at the people on the screen. Let's look at the people where they really are, which in, in the virtual world is, in, is, is that little dot we're looking at, that camera. All right, well, thank you for those questions. Uh, I wanna talk now about vocal skills. This area that can be too neglected, I think, when we're speaking. The truth is that when people watch us speak and let's say experience a talk that we give, that they, um, they are being influenced by the visuals more than anything else. And that's because our brain, the real estate in our brain is more taken up with processing visual information than auditory information. And the reason that's the case is for survival because any kind, any threats coming at us are more likely to come visually. So in terms of virtual communication, of course, in, in uh, virtual speaking, we're all looking at what people are looking like as they speak. However, vocal communication constitutes a huge amount. One famous study said it is about 38% of an audience's perception of us, and we ignore it to our peril. So one of the areas that we really need to improve our skills in, and this is really a body language issue as well, because the voice is produced physically. So what do we do in terms of get, uh, having a better voice that serves our needs as speakers? And to some extent, it means having a, a mellow, um, beautiful, powerful voice that people can have faith in and that sounds mature, mature and experienced, yet friendly, assertive, but not aggressive and pleasant to listen to. And that's, that's like the gold standard. But in terms of skills that we can use and get better at it, if it comes to improving our skills virtually or Otherwise, I think there are five important tools that I want to get across to you today as part of our, our workshop. And they are emphasis and energy, pitch inflection, pace and tempo, pauses and silence, and vocal quality. 
Now, the interesting thing about these is that they all work together and we should not use them one to the detriment of all the others. But just let me say quickly that the two that we have most problems with, and I think that all of us can benefit more in the way of a little vocal training is pitch inflection. And inflection, as you probably know, means highness or, or lowness changing the tone, not staying on one tone. So it's variety that keeps the ear of the listeners engaged and also allows you to uh, indicate important things rather than not so important things. So pitch inflection is very important. And if you want to know how to um, quickly get better at pitch inflection, if you have children or you have children's books around, read the children's book aloud as though you're reading to a three, four five, or five-year-old because the way we read to children is we inflect all over the place. So the birdie landed in the nest and she said, mommy, mommy, it's a little Robin. So we do this. And as silly as it may sound in our practice sessions, we can hear that we can get that kind of pitch inflection. And we really do need, you can see I'm demonstrating it here. We really do need a voice that's varied for people to tune in. And the other area I would say is don't be afraid of silence. Most of us are, and we don't pause enough, but pauses are very important for people to absorb something that we say that's, that they need to hear. But also when we transition from one segment of our talk to another, because the pause tells people that they can take a mental breath, they've absorbed what we've just said, and now they're ready for some new information, which means they are re-engaged. So get in the habit of pausing. Most of us don't pause enough when we speak. Part of it is nervousness, and we just tend to speak on and on and on and on. A pause also tells an audience that you're comfortable as a speaker. You are taking this advocacy or talk or whatever it is at exactly the pace you want to take it. And that breeds confidence in them and probably a bit more of a tendency to absorb what you say and believe it than if you look like you're nervously going through all your points. So uh, we have just a couple of minutes left, I believe. So um, do we have any other questions? Hey, Eric. Gary, we do have one more question. This is Raven here. Hi, Raven. Um, this question comes from Anthony Damesis and he asks, I always hear to speak from the diaphragm, but it's hard to know how to do that. Could you offer a practical tip slash example of how to actually do this? Absolutely. It is extremely important. It's one of the most important skills in terms of both vocal production and calming us and centering us and getting ready to speak. The easiest way to do it is to take your dominant hand and put it on your belly right about here. And to take nice, slow, deep breaths and feel if your belly is coming out because what happens is the diaphragm, which is located here, flattens and pushes your abdominal area out when you inhale. So if you are doing it right, you will feel the belly move backward and forward. If you're doing it, if your chest or shoulders are rising, you want that to be still and just get it down here. And the easiest way to do that is to stand in front of a mirror and practice what is really the way that your body wants to breathe and it just wants to get back to its normal way of breathing. We have uh, two, two questions actually in the chat as well. Uh, I, we might just only do the ones as we don't have much time, but what's the difference between pace and pausing? Pauses are an element of pace, stopping, but pace means overall, uh, what is the overall speed that you're speaking, as well as the rate of, of what you're saying. And it also has to do with how you um, how you deal with certain parts of your talk versus others. For instance, if you're talking about something that's an exciting moment that happened, you would be more likely that your pace will get faster. And when you're talking about something that's really important, here are the three things that I want us to bear in mind about this issue. You can hear that my pace slowed down. 
So the thing, the easiest thing I always believe in, in this regard is if you invest yourself in what you're saying, if you're not thinking about how you're doing, but you commit yourself to these ideas and emotions and what you're really trying to get across, your pace will vary naturally and organically, and it'll be that much more effective because it won't be imposed upon. The last thing you want to do is go through a talk that you have coming up and tell yourself where you're going to vary the pace. Spend the time committing yourself to the ideas and the, the important ideas will stand out like peaks. The other ideas will be less important and the places where you're not saying anything really important like I'm doing now will just be, as we say in the theater, thrown away. But that's a good thing because the important things will stand out. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Gary, for joining us for this excellent workshop. Uh, I'd like to, on behalf of Arbitration Place, I'd like to thank you for joining us. Uh, well, our... it has been fun, and I hope it's been uh, enjoyable and productive and educational for you all. And once again, uh, I wish you the very best in the competition. And um, as we say, in the, as we lovingly say in the theater, we mean it well, break a leg. <laughs> thank you so much, Gary. So thank you everyone once again for joining us. Uh, we now have our workshop on mentoring and sponsoring presented by Dana McGrath and Ben O'Kimmelman. Ben O'Kimmelman and Dana McGrath are faculty co-coaches of the Brooklyn Law School team. Ben was an independent arbitrator after decades of practice as an international arbitration practitioner. Ben is also an adjunct professor at Brooklyn Law School where he teaches international commercial arbitration, international litigation, and as I mentioned before, he coaches the Brooklyn Bismuth team. He was recently elected chair of the New York International Arbitration Center as well in January of 2021. Congratulations, Benno. Dana Thank is you. an investment manager at Omni Bridgeway, where she focuses on the company's arbitration investments. She also serves as an independent arbitrator. Prior to joining Omni Bridgeway, Dana was an international arbitration practitioner for approximately 20 years. She is now the president of Arbitral Women and on the ERA Pledge Steering Committee. Benno and Dana worked together at several law firms earlier as well in their respective careers, and they continue to co-coach the Brooklyn Bismuth team and have done for more than 10 years. With that, I turn things over to Benno and Dana for the workshop. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm happy to be here with Benno Kimmelman, who is um, one of my longtime mentors and um, colleagues in, in coaching and working and many other things. So I think it's, it's a good opportunity to talk about mentorship and sponsorship when you have a mentor mentee together as a team for this uh, short program we have today. So um, just to set the stage, uh, mentoring can be either formal or informal, and we'll talk about both. Uh, so we'll talk about mentorship through your organizations or your company, as well as mentorship from natural relationships that form from working with the team, either at work or in an organization or by somebody who you meet at an event or something. And then we will also talk about the difference between mentorship or mentoring and sponsorship and sponsoring and, and what's involved in that. Um, and we'll try to do all of that in, I guess, 30 or so minutes. So uh, just to sort of start with a mentorship through organizations, because I think that's what's most familiar to most people. There are increasingly a number of mentorship programs that are offered by various organizations, um, not the least of which is the Moot Alumni Association associated with Abyss Moot, which many of you may be familiar with. Um, I know that ICA's young group has a mentorship program. Arbitral Women, of which I am president, has a mentorship program, actually two. I'll describe it more fully later. And there are many um, young practitioner groups of arbitral institutions or organizations that offer mentorship programs. So if you are looking to uh, join a mentorship program, a little internet research should probably lead you to a couple of options. 
Uh, but before we go to external mentorship programs, I think it would be interesting to hear from Benno, um, who's been with a number of firms and uh, at chair of departments at those firms about mentorship within a law firm or company setting. Thank you, Dana. Uh, I, I think that um, there, there are really two different kinds of mentorship or arrangements. Uh, very the ones, and I'm familiar with both, but the one I'm most familiar with is the one within one's own firm, within one's own organization, where um, where you over time develop relationships with with younger lawyers who are interested in in what you do and in how, most importantly, how they can develop the skills and the experience so that they can really uh, do what they want to do and become uh, very successful practitioners. And so that's one kind of, of mentorship. On the other hand, as Dana mentioned, there are a number of organizations that provide that kind of assistance and guidance. And that's from, and that would be from someone who's outside the organization in which you work and, and would have a, a different perspective possibly on uh, what you've been doing and how it's contributing to your, your own development. So, so starting with the first, uh, within your own firm, uh, it's probably not surprising to say that, that, that in, uh, in a law firm and in most organizations, there's always really a, a competition amongst um, the, the partners and amongst the senior uh, attorneys to really uh, um, uh, draw to their areas of expertise, the most talented, the most um, uh, committed uh, the, the, the younger lawyers who really, wanna, who really want to learn and, and develop their skills and develop their careers. And so um, some people come to mentoring because they love to do it, because they, they have a, a, a teaching instinct that, that this really appeals to. And others are, are drawn to it for a very pragmatic reason. And that is they want, they want to be sure that the things that they think are important to do um, become attractive to the to those younger lawyers who are coming into the firm and, and, and whose time and whose energy is really being sought out. Um, and so uh, depending, regardless of which, per, which perspective prevails, um, it becomes very important, um, uh, both in terms of uh, finding the right people to work on the matters that you work on yourself and that you think are interesting and are exciting and are important. Um, and it's also important to keep in mind that, that, that younger lawyers who come usually straight out of, out of legal training have very little practical experience. And so what they're going to be able to do and what skills they're going to be able to ultimately have really depend very much on what you're able to, to expose them to, what you're gonna be able to teach them to be able to do and to help them to, to learn themselves in terms of building their, their, their sort of arsenal of, of skills. And so both those things lead to, to developing relationships where one is a teacher and a guide um, uh, so, that, so that younger lawyers who really are interested in what we do um, learn what they should think about doing in the, in the near term, but also what they should be keeping in mind for the long term in terms of building their skills and, and building sort of their arsenal um, of, of achievements um, and of, um, of the skill set to be able to be uh, productive and, um, and contributing attorneys and to develop their reputation. Because in our area of practice, developing one's reputation is sometimes just as important as developing one's skill set. So I, having worked with Benno at, in the law firm setting, uh, I, I now am happy to say that it, we've had a very successful mentorship relationship. But before I developed that relationship with Benno, I developed mentorship relationships with associates who worked above me and under Benno. So your relationships with your mentors kind of evolve. And the ones that are most within reach are often a year or two or three ahead of you, as opposed to the senior partner or chair of the department. That's not to say that the chair of a department isn't willing and happy to take you on as a mentee, uh, but be 
be aware that there are people who might be more accessible and who might be closer to the skill set that you need to develop now to be able to ultimately uh, reach the next level and perform the, the more complicated and challenging skills as you progress as either an associate at a law firm or in a company. I'd like to just take a moment as president of Arbitral Women to tell you about our mentorship programs, which some of you may be familiar with. We have two mentorship programs. One is what I'll style a professional mentorship program, which is where we pair two professionals that are members of Arbitral Women um, that we think are well-matched to spend a one-year tour of mentorship together. And, uh, and then from there, you know, they take it themselves. And this program is run by Allison Purcell, Amanda Lee, and Yasmin Lalu, and they have expanded this program tremendously over the last few years. So this is the largest mentorship class we've ever had. And we not only have the mentor and mentee meet periodically, virtually in pandemic, but um, hopefully that will be in person at some point soon. Uh, but we also have expanded to have group mentorship meetings. And this is a fantastic development. Uh, I credit the, the mentorship committee for coming up with this idea of bringing all the mentors and mentees together in a virtual meeting where they have the chance to meet each other and therefore network with a far broader group than um, they would by the one-on-one -on -one mentorship relationship. And also hear from inspiring successful women in the field of international arbitration. So that's sort of a new development in our mentorship program, which complements the one-on-one -on -one mentor mentee dialogue that is intended to more be a safe space confidence kind of discussion about do's and don'ts and you can ask questions and get advice and ideas on how to progress your career. Another mentorship program that Arbitral Women offers is a parental mentorship program. And this is aimed at offering advice, support and resources to women who are either starting a family or have young children or have children or are contemplating starting a family and wanna know how professionals handle that, you know, the work-life balance, the challenges of being a parent as well as a professional. And that is also a one-on-one -on -one mentor mentee match, but we have additionally included group meetings amongst those who are in the parental mentorship program where there can be a safe space dialogue amongst a group of people who are either parents or considering being parents, or in my case, having been a parent for some years, can share some do's and don'ts uh, and uh, anecdotes about that experience in a way that can either provide guidance or um, at a minimum, let you know that you are not alone in the challenges that you faced. And I think that that's an important theme that runs throughout mentorship, whether it's a professional mentorship relationship or parental or any kind of mentorship. Uh, we, a lot of us face similar challenges and we feel that we are somehow unique or, or in the minority of facing those challenges. And through mentorship relationships, you realize that actually you are facing challenges that are similarly faced by many others and you feel less alone in it, more empowered to take those on. So um, I encourage anyone who's interested in being mentored or being a mentor uh, to explore that opportunity. If you're a member of Arbitral Women, we welcome you to join our mentorship program. And um, I think it's a valuable resource to everybody. I think one point that I wanted to just mention before we move on to the next topic is how a mentee can try to make the most of the mentorship relationship, the one-on-one, -on -one, so to speak, with their mentor. And I've seen mentors actually um, provide advice on how to do this and mentees to come with this sort of checklist or skill set um, already prepared. And it's it's radically different from what I saw 10 years ago when the mentorship relationship was far more informal. So today, often 
a mentee will set up a virtual meeting and we'll have a list of, you know, five to eight questions that they want to put to the mentor and get input on. Um, the mentee might ask for introductions to people who are in a field that uh, the mentee is interested in learning more about or uh, can offer opportunities. Um, and essentially, you can come away from a mentor-mentee meeting with a checklist of what each of you are going to do. So I recently had a mentor-mentee meeting, and we came away with four takeaways that were on my plate to do, make introductions or, or otherwise uh, do some things. And she had some things on her list, and we touch base periodically by email and by Zoom meeting to progress those. And so you sort of, it's not a business plan, but it's sort of an action plan that makes the mentorship program um, more easily uh, maximized in a one year program. Now, one year is, it's only a year. So it's really not meant to radically plan your career. It's really to make an introduction to somebody who can be a lifelong uh, contact and mentor even when the one-year mentorship program ends. Some, some places do two-year mentorship programs, but I encourage everyone to try to think of a mentorship relationship as a lifelong relationship and not tied to the technical one-year or two-year program that it emanates from. Sometimes I, I think about um, the program um, as uh, it can be about a list of skills and a list of goals, but also it's sometimes important to keep in mind that in what we do, many people have different views on what skills are really necessary, essential, valuable in being a successful international arbitration practitioner. Um, and, and some of that has to do with each of our own personal experiences in, in developing our skills and in developing our careers. And, and I've often thought it's very important that, that younger lawyers um, recognize the fact that there's no one path to being successful in, in this field, that there are many different roads that people travel uh, at various different speeds, uh, achieving many different things along the way, um, and, and that all of that is perfectly um, appropriate and, and can be sometimes actually necessary and valuable um, and, and just realizing how different um, uh, paths there are can be really quite liberating um, and, and allow for much greater creativity uh, about thinking about the future. And so I, I find it helpful to talk about that because it's not always so obvious that there, that, that, um, that there's so many different choices one can make and, um, and there's no right path. I think that's a really important point, and especially given the time we are in now, which is you know uh, a year into a pandemic, which has changed for many people the course of their career or their academic program. Um, we saw a similar situation when there was the financial crisis about 10 years ago, and people had to pivot and figure out how they were going to pursue their career ambitions in a, a different way than maybe people had done it five years before traditionally. And I think that this is a really great opportunity for people to think outside the box and take a fresh look at what they're interested in and what kind of people they wanna connect with. So in looking for mentorship opportunities, I think that attending events, virtual or in-person, when in-person becomes possible is really useful and you'll connect with people who you wouldn't otherwise be brought into contact with. Uh, I also encourage people to join committees, be it a bar committee or um, one of the organizations, uh, arbitral organizations. Have they, there are so many committees that you can join. And if you join a committee, you should try to be proactive and engage and, and participate actively and visibly so that you can really be seen and reach out to the people who are involved in the organization. And that might lead to a mentorship relationship or just a useful professional contact. 
social media is also increasingly an opportunity to find mentors or networking or opportunities. For example, uh, Careers in Arbitration, the, the organization launched by Amanda Lee that's on LinkedIn, posts all sorts of internship and job opportunities. Social media is now a tremendously valuable resource for finding jobs that would not otherwise be visible. So I encourage you uh, to, to look at that handle on LinkedIn, if you haven't already. But given the time, I think we should probably move to sponsorship. Benno, do you wanna kick that off? Yeah, um, so, so when, what we've talked about in terms of mentoring is, is really the, 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 what can be a, the one-on-one -on -one between someone who, who hopefully has a lot of diverse experience and can impart guidance and suggestions and uh, interesting ideas in terms of how to move forward with a career and, and developing skills. Um, and that's, that's critically important to, to, frankly, to both mentors and to mentees, because as I said before, teaching is really, um, is, is such an important part of what we do in the profession. Um, but there's another element to it as well, and that is as, as a lawyer uh, develops his or her skill set and, uh, and experience and expertise, it's very important that, uh, that that be seen and appreciated and highly regarded, not just by the, the people that are part of his or her team where, you know, in the firm where they work or in the organization that they're part of, but they're seen more widely because so much of what we do in this in, in, in international arbitration depends on, on the reputation that we have, on how others outside our places of employment regard us, um, how we're valued, uh, whether our advice is sought or our participation is sought in various activities or various committees. And all of that really contributes to our, not just to our professional development, but frankly, to our, our personal development. And to the to the um, uh, the sense that we have that what we're doing is important and is valuable and is contributing to our community and to our profession. And so, um, to be a sponsor, there there are many different sort of aspects of sponsoring. It it oftentimes starts within the firm in which one is working with someone for whom one is a mentor, uh, because. It's important that if someone's doing well and developing his or her skill set and developing the experience that's important, that others know about it. Um, one's career is not does not happen in a vacuum. Uh, whether it's a firm or a company or another organization, other people's uh, perceptions and other people's uh, willingness to reach out to someone and to believe that that a younger lawyer has all the skills necessary to progress his or her career is really is, is, is essential. And so there, there is the sponsorship that takes place within the firm or the company itself, but it really sponsorship is, is much broader than that because in our community in particular, we all know that, that how we're regarded by the organizations that we're a part of, how, we're, how we're, we are regarded by arbitral institutions, how we're, we are regarded by arbitrators and arbitration practitioners around the world is essential to our, our reputations and, and essential to our ability to function as, as contributing members of our community and, and to be uh, the kinds of, of, of advocates and the kinds of professionals that we wanna be. So sponsoring means um, uh, speaking up on behalf of someone, suggesting that you know there's someone I know who would be just perfectly well suited to be a member of this committee or better yet to co-chair this committee, because I know, the, I know the work the committee does and I know the work of this younger lawyer and he or she is just perfectly suited for it. And to, to, to take that step and to be the sponsor really lends credibility and um, uh, uh, to, to a younger lawyer, which, which is invaluable in, in, the, in progressing one's career. And so I think there, there, there are those both aspects to it that are very important to how, um, to how we help each other 
and all of us know that we've always, we ourselves have been the recipients of that over the course of our careers, because none of us would, would be where we are today were it not for the fact that uh, other attorneys for whom we spent many, many hours yeah. working very hard and being very diligent ultimately spoke up in our behalf and, and essentially you know, credited us as being professionals who should be respected and who should progress. And so it's really, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fundamental, fundamentally important aspect of what we do. I couldn't agree more. And I, I have to say that some of the opportunities that I've received have been sponsorship in nature. And uh, sometimes they are at first a, an invitation to take on a role in a committee that may be a role that is new to you and could be somewhat intimidating. But if you put your heart into it and work really hard and do well in that role, it can lead to progression in that, that committee or in other committees. Um, you know, when a sponsor proposes you for the role of you know, secretary of a committee or co-chair of a committee, the sponsor is really putting his or her credibility behind you. Um, and it's really important as the person who is sponsored to honor that and respect that and to really do your best to fulfill it. And I have to say of the people who I have sponsored, I have been tremendously proud and pleased and excited to see them thrive and seize the opportunity and really develop their own external profile using that opportunity. And so that's what you can do outside the firm, be it a bar committee, uh, some other organization. If you take any kind of opportunity of a leadership role that's given to you by a sponsor and you make the most of it, it is a tremendously valuable experience. Um, another way that one can sponsor, so to speak, or support externally the, the skill set and expertise of, um, of people who are rising in this field is by promoting on either social media or other accessible platforms the achievements and skill sets of those people. And so Arbitral Women has actually developed a very extensive program to do just that. And we have what's called member news. And for every member who has an achievement, whether it's a promotion to a senior level at their company, maybe they made counsel or made partner or promoted at a company or made a lateral move or were awarded uh, an achievement prize or have done something that is worthy of re uh, recognition and sharing broadly, we report on that. And some of you may have been chased by our news team because when we see any inkling that there's been something to report on, uh, we try to reach out to you. Um, we do find that often women are a bit modest and don't raise their hand and say, please, uh, will you ce please celebrate that I made partner? you have to see it somewhere else and reach out to them and say, we want to celebrate that you made partner and we want to make that news that's seen throughout the world. And Arbitral Woman fortunately has a platform to communicate across the world. So our member news is in a very important aspect of what we do because the more visible you are to the international arbitration community and the more Broadly, your skill set and expertise are known by, by potential um, clients who might appoint you as arbitrator or clients who might appoint you as lead counsel or as an expert in a case. If they don't know who you are and they don't know your skill set, they'll never think to appoint you or they might be skeptical if counsel puts you on a list. But if they've heard about you and they are repeatedly reminded that you continue to achieve um, promotions and awards and, you know, you're speaking at things and demonstrating your expertise, the more that that is out in the public domain, the more credibility you have in your space. So sponsorship is 
being supported by people whose credibility hopefully complements your credibility and skill set and experience. So you see a lot on social media of somebody uh, congratulating somebody else on having just finished a chapter, launched a chapter in a book or God forbid, written an entire book. I can't imagine that. I know many people have done it. It's a challenge I've not taken on or have been promoted. And and when you see see people sponsoring other people by making it news about somebody else's professional developments, I think that's at the heart of sponsorship. It happens within the firm, but within a law firm that's internal. Um, there's a lot of sponsorship that happens outside, external. And in the year of pandemic, when we're all on social media, uh, it's a perfect opportunity to develop the ability to either sponsor others or honestly to have the courage to, to promote yourself, which is something that doesn't come naturally to everybody. But if you have an achievement and you want to share it, um, you should you should learn how to do that and observe how other people do it so that the world can know the skill set that you bring. There are two questions that we have that maybe we can try to answer now. Um, the first one was goes back a bit to the, the mentor-mentee relationship, and that is what are the criteria for matching? And, you know, in my experience, the criteria that are used really differ from Firm to firm, institution to institution. Um, in in some in the firms where I where I have where we've had programs, uh, and and each firm has had a program. Very often, the the criteria are as simple as is someone interested in international arbitration, and um, and of course that's what I do. And so I would be matched up with with the people who have that interest. In, in, other, in other situations, there may be, the, the criteria may be more finely um, uh, attuned because someone's looking for something specific. Um, but, but I think, I, I think it, it's, at least in my experience, it's been having a general interest in the area that you, you really spend your, most of your time in that can lead to um, a, a very constructive and productive mentor mentee relationship. So um, there's another question, I think that is really on point for this discussion. Um, How do you approach someone to ask for sponsorship? And that is, that can be done in a number of different ways. So within a law firm, I think you would approach, uh, you know, someone senior, presumably a partner who who you've worked with enough to know your quality of work and hopefully with whom you have a relationship that they they feel confident that they can present your skill set and um and not take any exposure on their end for having done so but there when it comes to sort of a social media promotion or external world uh promotion i think that that's an important time to think about your uh, peer mentors and peer colleagues, as well as people who are senior to you. Um, Because I think anyone can sponsor another. And I think that your friends or your colleagues, you know, people tend not to say that they're friends because saying your friends, you know, suddenly, you know, 20 years later, somebody says, you're conflicted because you said you were a friend. Like we're professional colleagues that respect each other and think highly of each other. And you should have no hesitation to reach out to people who you believe based on your interactions with them would think highly of you, whether or not they are the kind of person that regularly sponsors somebody. So you'll see on on social media, some people are sponsoring people left and right. Every day they're sponsoring someone. Then you'll see sponsorship by someone who does it maybe once or twice a year. You should choose someone who your relationship defines as an appropriate sponsor and someone who you would feel comfortable reaching out to. And anytime just in my life that I've been asked either, um, would you help share the news of my 
promotion or would you suggest a way that I could get more visibility for being chair of the such and such committee? I'm very open to that. And I suspect that anyone that you would think of in your world who you would approach for that would be open to it too. So it takes a little bit of courage. All of these things do, but there are many more sponsors out there than you probably realize. So reach out. We're open to other questions if there are other questions. We'll hold, we'll hold off and see if uh, there's any questions uh, just for a few more minute, uh, seconds, sorry. Okay. And if not, I'd like to just thank both you, Dana and Benno for uh, presenting such a great workshop on mentoring and sponsoring. I know I was taking notes the whole time and I'll be checking out the recording later on as well for my future career. Well, thank you for having us and I hope it was useful. Um, I know that there, through Arbitral Women, our mentorship program has expanded so much in the past two years that mentorship and sponsorship are on the minds of the new generation much more than they ever were. So whatever we can do to be a resource and, and help inform people and advise people, we're happy to do it. And it's good that it's on people's minds now because it, 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 I think it's gratifying for those who were asked to, to be constructive contributors to someone's career. Um, and it makes our community a far better place to, to, to practice um, and to build relationships when you know that people are, are, are willing and able to sort of reach out and be helpful. Um, that, that's really, it says a lot about what we do and about who we are if we really do it well. Certainly. So thank you so much uh, once again for joining us on this workshop. Uh, that concludes uh, the day one of the API pre-mood event. Okay, so welcome everyone to our final event of the Arbitration Place Invitational. I have the great pleasure of introducing Wendy Miles, Reka Rangachari, and Barry Leon for our workshop on networking, in a on networking in a virtual world. Wendy specializes in international arbitration and dispute resolution with a focus on private and public international law at 20 SX Chambers in London. With over 25 years of experience, Wendy has advised on international law matters and conducted arbitrations under all the major institutions and ad hoc. She has advised a wide range of multinationals, including corporates, so sovereign state and state entities, and multilateral state organizations. Wendy has sat as an arbitrator since 2005 under most major arbitral institutions, and she is a UK appointee to uh, ICSID's Panels of Arbitrator and Conciliators. In climate change and finance, Wendy acts as a global coordinating council to major corporates in relation to climate change transition, disclosure, reporting, compliance, and investment. She advises investors and states in respect of climate-related physical transition and litigation risk. Wendy also works closely with several states in relation to climate transition and regulatory structures. She also works closely with the ICC and has represented it at the Conference of the Parties on Climate Change uh, since 2015. Reka Rangachari is the Executive Director of the New York International Arbitration Center and a well-known figure in international arbitration circles. Prior to joining NIAC, Reka was a director of ADR services for the New York Commercial Division of the AAA ICDR and also served as an ICDR case counsel. In the New York State Bar Association, she serves on the Dispute Resolution Section's Executive Committee, as co-chair of the International Disputes Resolution Committee, on the Planning Committee for the Judith K. Moot Court Competition, on the International Sector's Executive Committee, and as co-chair of the International Contracts and Commercial Law Committee. Rake is also a member of the New York City Bar's Women in the Legal Profession Standing Committee and affiliate member of the Arbitration Committee. Rake is active in the New York Coalition of Women's Initiatives, the Association for Conflict Resolution of Greater New York, and the, the American Bar Association and Arbitral Women as well. And lastly, Barry Leon is an independent arbitrator and mediator with Arbitration Place, 
He is also with 33 Bedford Road Chambers in London and the Caribbean Arbitrators in the Virgin, British Virgin Islands. Barry is a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and an International Mediator, Mediation Institute Certified Mediator. From 2015 to 2018, he was presiding judge of the British Virgin Islands Commercial Court. He is also the former chair of ICC Canada's Arbitration Committee. He was head of the Pearlie Robertson Hale and McDougall International Arbitration Group. And before that, Barry was a litigation and dispute resolution partner at Tories. He is a fellow of the International Academy of Trial Lawyers and a recipient of the CPR Award for Outstanding Contribution to Diversity in Alternate Dispute Resolution. Barry's other current professional activities include the Canadian Arbitration Week, the Canadian Journal of Commercial Arbitration, the BVI Arbitration Group, the Toronto Commercial Arbitration Society's Arbitration Act Review Committee, and this Arbitration Place Invitational. Thank you very much. And as you can see, uh, all three of our speakers are very involved in the arbitration committee community. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. And welcome to everybody. It's good to see you. In this workshop, uh, Wendy, Reka, and I are going to discuss with you three main topics. What networking is and why it's important. Why virtual networking is important and here to stay even when we resume networking physically in person at conferences, social events, lunches, and dinners. And third, some techniques and tips for how to network effectively, both physically in person and virtually. None of us are going to pretend to be an expert on networking. We are messengers. Many of the things that we will discuss with you this afternoon or this evening or this morning, depending where you are, are things that we've picked up from others over the years and in the case of virtual networking over the past year. So let's begin with what is networking and why it's important. Wendy? Thanks, Barry, and, and hello, everybody. And for anyone who is on sort of a UK schedule, uh, happy Mother's Day. <laughs> um, the, um, it's nice to see you all. The photos I'm seeing are of um, mostly people in, in my networking and have probably taught me more than, more than I can say, but I'm hoping um, there's some younger and, and newer folks who, are, who haven't got their faces up. And we're going to talk about virtual networking in our third question, but the first thing I'd say about that is put your face up. <laughs> so it's much easier to network when, when people can see you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Very good. Welcome, Ryan. Um, so what is networking? Well, it's, it's, it's basically um, your community, right? It's your community of professionals. That's what we talk about with networking in the work context. But what it really is, and just to demystify it, because I actually thought about this a lot when we were prepping for this, it's getting to know people. That's all it is. And I know when I was told that I had to network and given training as a young partner and how to network, but I found it all a bit um, fake, a bit unnatural, a bit inauthentic. And so I didn't really pay much attention to it. I just like people. I'm very nosy, so I like to know about people. And so I sp <laughs> spend a bit of time and I, I tend to remember connections, but I think actually that's about as most as you'll get taught in professional networking. It's about getting to know people and getting to know people is just spending the time and making the effort and turning on your camera is one of the ways we make the effort um, in this virtual world. And I think in, in getting to know people professionally is not that different to getting to know people if you start a new school, a new law school, a new, start a new community, a new church, a new sports club. It's just spending the time making the effort um, to, to build those relationships and get to know people. Networking and arbitration and international arbitration is as important as in any other field, I would say, because so much of what we do happens behind closed doors. So much of the decision-making on who we nominate, who we send our conflicts to, who we instruct happens based on information we learn behind closed doors. So without networking, it's a really difficult, difficult profession to get ahead in. 
Marika? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I can't echo that enough. And I think most of these tiles on the screen, you, you all know that sometimes I think calling it networking makes it sound seedier, like we have to have this uh, everything put together. And in, in truth, as Wendy said, it's just getting to know one another to be authentic, which is a word I think that's been used a lot um, in these remote um, settings and to be candid. Uh, because people do want to get to know you. And frankly, you're being beamed into each other's homes. <laughs> Life is colliding in real time. And it's it's tough to sort of avoid, uh, you know, not commenting um, on the artifacts that Barry has, for example, behind him and his shelving um, or otherwise. And, you know, we were talking about this in our planning session too, but, you know, in some ways, the the networking of past days, right? When we would do it in person, when it was safe to do that, I always felt you needed to have a friend, you know, either you walked in with one or you identified them in the room. Um, it, it was tougher to go in cold. And I think in virtual, you really gain a benefit of, you don't have to have a friend <laughs> to socialize you in the crowd. You can do it cold and hopefully meet people that way. Um, and I do think there's some relevance of trying to be thoughtful about picking the kinds of networking sessions that you do. Um, are there smaller breakouts focused? Is there a topic that anchors? And we'll get into that. Um, later in the session. But I do think it is about showing up and being intentional and turning on your camera. I have often run networking events where people show up and they stay muted and their camera off. And I always think maybe they didn't realize what the session was, but the whole focus is networking and we don't get to meet them. What a, what a shame. But uh, with that, very curious, how are you finding all of it? What do you conceive of as networking? Well, what I wanted to talk about next, Rega, and talk a little bit more about virtual in a few minutes, is that uh, the concept that business networking doesn't have to just occur in a business setting. Uh, it can occur with people in law or in business in other parts of your life. Uh, kids sporting events, dance and music lessons, uh, other organizations, whether they're religious, community, social, service like Rotary, uh, those are all places where people network and meet connections which can be helpful to them uh, in, their, in their careers. And then I would say also don't forget about networking with people in your former lives with law school classmates. We've got John Keefe on here, a former classmate of mine, uh, with people who you know from uh, degrees that you took before law school and uh, from people in, in industries where you worked before, which if you were working in technology, uh, those are people who can be very valuable to you in your uh, law arbitration network. And while there are um, obvious groups in which arbitration practitioners can network, uh, it can, network can, can really be any common denominator. Uh, arbitral women, uh, the common denominator obviously is gender, uh, in a recent uh, webinar on this topic, Alison Purcell uh, spoke about Canadians uh, who uh, have a network around the world because Canadians are working in firms uh, all around the world doing arbitration. And uh, for this audience, uh, for the students, it's the Vismut alumni, which is a, a wonderful network uh, that can stand you in good stead for the rest of your uh, arbitration careers. Wendy? So the women, can I pick up on the women, um, Barry, because I think that's really important. And I, I think it's worth a couple of observations. One, uh, picking up on something Rake has said on when we used to be in the room together and when we'll be back in the room together. I found that through arbitral women and those little really um, sort of comfortable, comfy, dinners we would have as arbitral women and quite small groups, that that actually gave me the friend when I got to the bigger setting. So if I got to the IBA arbitration day or the LCIA Tilney Hall session, which was a bit bigger and a bit scarier and lots of people who everyone knew, I had my friend because I'd met her, whoever she was, in a smaller arbitral women's setting. And often, you know, you could just attach yourself to that person. And there's some concrete things that are quite useful to know. If you're in a cocktail meeting and you're breaking into a conversation, it's really hard to break into a conversation of two, but three is much easier. So you look for those 
odd numbers. It's, it's you know, these are the sorts of, sorts of things you get in, in the training. Wear your name tag, if you can, um, up on your, sorry, on your left-hand side, because as you go in to shake people's hands, I don't know if we'll shake hands again, but if you go in to shake people's hands, they can see the label there. You know, again, they're not things that I liked to have to learn because they felt so contrived, but actually it's really useful because if you say hi to someone and they look down at your navel, at your lanyard, you immediately think, oh, you don't remember me, this is awkward. Um, so, so little things like that um, are really helpful. Leveraging your, your smaller networks, whether it's your Canadian network or your law school network or your women's network, whatever that little network is, leveraging that in the bigger settings. Um, and understanding that, you know, the word network, I think it's so many meanings, doesn't it? But the, the relationships you build in your professional career, I think, you know, most of the people I can see on the screen would, would I'm sure say the same. The relationships that you build throughout your career, they enrich your whole life. You're not building those relationships because I think, well, that woman and that man and that man will send me work one day. That's not actually the way you think about it. Or if you do, you're going to be disappointed in international arbitration because everything's a much longer burn. And, and you never know, usually, if you're recommended as counsel for something, as arbitrator for something, often you don't know where it came from, where that recommendation came from. So it's actually building that, that it is a network of relationships in your community that really matters professionally, but it matters personally. And this is, this is the thing. We, when we walk through this journey, I started an international arbitration at 29, and I'm now 50. And in those years, those 21 years, I have gotten married, had two children, had one child start university, changed partnerships, moved to the bar. I've, I've really had some big dramatic changes in my life. And I've done all of that through a community that I built from 29, starting as an international arbitration lawyer, because I changed cities, I changed countries, I changed hemispheres. Um, coming from New Zealand and uh, you know it just gave me that that community and that's what it's about to me that community gave me my scaffolding when I struggled when the firm didn't have a maternity policy when I was the first associate ever to have gotten pregnant in, in the office um, and I had to write my own maternity policy that was awkward um, and I had women from other law firms who could give me their templates and help me out and just give me the support. Um, you know, mums at the school gate, dads at the school gate, uh, but just that community all the way through all those milestone steps. Work experience, when the kids do that, you know, all of those things, that, that's, that's what this community is about. And I have to say this, this is an extremely fulfilling career. It's an extremely demanding career. And at times it's an utterly exhausting career. And without that community, I don't think it ever would have been worth it. Rekha? I, I fully agree, you know, and I think, I remember when I first um, started in law and um, a mentor said, you have to make a goal for yourself when you walk into a room, you should meet at least, meet at least three people, but not just by collecting business cards, right? Three purposeful contacts, insert whichever number that you prefer, but sometimes, Otherwise, you just hang out with those that you already know. Um, it sounds so obvious, but um, it felt empowered. Um, so sometimes, uh, you know, you didn't feel like doing that. But if you're not going to approach getting to know people with purpose, then it defeats the purpose altogether, um, right? And I, I think the other thing that I always found interesting was, um, of course, we're all trying to scope out whose name tag is where and, and who do we want to meet, right, for the overall trajectory. But sometimes the people you didn't expect to meet that you end up, you know, in a piece of the room with, that maybe you're trying to pivot to another conversation, they might be the most instrumental in that moment down the road. And so um, what I often find, too, you know, as a, as a consummate New Yorker who hosts a lot of events, um, both now in these new times and even before, what I always found intriguing when I would go to get my refill um, at the bar was to look around and see how were people moving <laughs> throughout the room? Were they doing with panache and respect? 
Were they abrupt, irrespective of age or experience? Because um, these are important too, right? These signals we give to each other um, about whether we want to be talking to them or not. <laughs> um, but, but in truth, uh, networking is so much also about sharing our, our candid moments, our challenges, in addition to exchanging you know, best practices on, on what's happening um, in the market. Um, and so something that was shared at one of the Arbitral Women networking sessions, not my own words, but repurposed here is, you know, networking is about being interested and not interesting. And I really liked that. It really resonated with me because it's a big onus to show up and, and try to be interesting. It's much easier to just, you know, listen and, and take it in and respond appropriately. And I think, especially for students, but for all of us, right? Um, on any given day, we certainly don't feel interesting all the time. The other thing I just wanted to share was that um, when you don't find, let's say a particular community where you want to activate and talk about certain things, you also have the luxury to create it. And I say that because this year we launched this group, uh, Racial Equality for Arbitration Lawyers, acknowledging the void of being able to talk about race in our big you know, international arbitration space. We are all so international under different definitions, but we somehow couldn't with civility <laughs> talk about race. Part of it was we didn't know where to start talking about race, right? And so how do you jump into such a loaded conversation? Um, but, you know, that group, I'm so excited to have the conversations on the grassroots level that we have to have locally first before we can get global. Um, but it reminds me very readily of really phenomenal networking sessions I've had with arbitral women, groups, that break down the big space into smaller spaces to give you a sense of access. Um, and so that's been really rewarding. The other thing, because there's so many coaches on the line as well, I have found, you know, when you receive a lot of emails, sometimes we forget that we need to make our own connections and reach out to others. So for every sort of angry email you get, to send an email yourself, purposeful connections for your own network. Um, I think with life, what it is right now and everything colliding, it, it's easy to forget that. We're just so good at responding to the emails that are coming in instead of activating on our own accord to flip content or share something or, or move things along within our own network. I'm just gonna add one thought on this, which I think is a wonderful expression uh, about being interested rather than thinking you need to be interesting. And that is part of one way to, to show that you're interested is to not just li obviously listen and, and pay attention to what the person is saying, but, uh, and, and I learned this from a uh, corporate partner in my uh, law firm many years ago, you, you send something to people. You, you know, if you know that, that uh, somebody's interested in a particular topic, whether it's cooking, whether it's running, whether it, it, it's a legal issue, send them an article if you see it, send them a case, uh, send them books, whatever, uh, it just, it has an amazing effect of showing that you actually paid attention to them and are trying to be helpful. And we should probably turn to virtual networking. Uh, the, so before, before I, I uh, say what I was going to say, the, the equivalent of wearing your name tag on the left, which I think is, is, is really important, is on a Zoom call, make sure that your name uh, on the box is the way you wanna have it shown first name, last name, uh, possibly your organization. Uh, so many people don't. And in a networking session online, that's obviously can be more difficult. So we've been living in a virtual world for a year now, uh, just over a year by a day or two. Uh, have both of you found ways of networking in a virtual world uh, that are effective? I, I think I have found some. Um, what are some of the things that, that, that both of you do and what have you seen others do that you think is effective? But Wendy, can I ask you first? Um, I want to sing. We're living in a virtual world and I am a virtual girl, you know, it just kind of popped into my head. <laughs> I won't sing or you'll never ever forget me um, for the wrong reasons. Uh, <laughs> that, yeah, look, it's tough, Barry. And I'm not going to pretend it's easy. I, I, I am just, you know, for my own part, completely and utterly 
sick of seeing you all and little rectangles. I want to see you. I want to, you know, shake your hand. I want to give those I know well a hug. I just, I, I have a drink together, you know, be on the same time zone. Um, so I'm a little tired of it. Um, and, and my community is already established. So I cannot imagine how hard it is for people who are trying to build a community with this barrier. I had thought initially it had a lot of um, positives, accessibility, people who couldn't otherwise spend the money to travel to things could attend more things. Um, and I, I think as time has go gone on and more literature has been published about the psychology of, of these settings, um, I'm starting to learn more and more about the, um, you know, the shortcomings of it. And, and in particular, again, for women, I had thought initially it was a wonderful equalizer that the, the, you know, the tall, booming, overbearing man in the meeting was suddenly the same size rectangle as everybody else. But, you know, I hear stories, I read literature about um, the, the sort of um, bullying of younger women that, that still happens on these screens and, and it breaks my heart. Um, I think, this is where I've come to, it's taken me a year. <laughs> <laughs> but this is where I've come to um, reading some some sort of networking uh, analysis and things on why people find it difficult from Harvard University long before lockdown. What seems to be the case is it's much easier to network down than to network up. So if you have the position of seniority, so you're the moot coaches, you're the moot judges, you're, you're the senior people, the hosts, it's much easier to network down. Those, the, 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 the mooties who come up and make that call or come up afterwards and say, really lovely to meet you, can I have your card? It's not an easy thing to do. <laughs> and, and so I think we, I think the more senior people who are already part of the community have to work a little bit harder to make sure that people coming in don't lose out. So if you get off a session like this and someone sends you a LinkedIn, accept it. And, and you know, if you can see they're at the moot, maybe send an offline message on how did they go? How are they finding it? But it's, it's exactly what Rake has said about sending as well as receiving. It's one thing to answer all your emails, but actually reaching out occasionally too. So I think, I think we lose a lot in the community that we have to keep building up because that, that community that grows under us is what keeps international arbitration going um, with its you know, high level of integrity and frankly, authenticity. So I think we need to work a little bit harder when we're not in the room. And I think that, that sits on us. And as I say, it's taken me a year to get there. I've not done it as much as I wish I had have done it going backwards because we're all just trying to survive. Um, but, you know, it's, it's my undertaking to do more, and I think we, we, we all perhaps could and should. Marika? Yeah, I, I echo that um, no expert in any way at this in the, in the virtual. I think we're all doing it best we can on any given day. Um, I've had um, the pleasure to host a lot of these sessions under different hats, um, and, and some of the things I really liked, and I mentioned it earlier, was when sessions, for example, during New York Arbitration Week or even with arbitral women, when we went into our breakouts, there was a suggested, gently suggested purpose. <laughs> um, of course, networking has to be organic. So if people wanna talk about whatever, they, that's their time to do it. But often what we were finding is that we get into these breakouts and we spend the whole time just introducing ourselves. And so I also give a tip of my hat uh, to David Samuels at GAR, who I know um, was with us earlier because this idea of, as Barry said, your name, but it could be your name, your affiliation, your city, things not only that anchor who you are to the group, but maybe even kick off a conversation, whether we're talking about um, vaccinations, this happens to be a, a big conversation we spend a lot of time on in our breakouts or otherwise, how's it going there versus here? Let's do a comparative review of our jurisdictions um, and what's going on. But the idea of not spending the whole time necessarily on just making the introductions has been really nice. So we actually get to connect on something and then that takes us into the rest of our lives, I'd like to say, right? Because we're just constantly picking people up and hopefully not dropping people 
um, off. I, I really like, and I guess I just wanted to underscore what, um, what Wendy said about um, how it's, it's easier in one tranche versus another. Um, I recall, I was thinking about this scenario once going back to, you know, um, being an ever voyeur and watching once when I was at a VIS uh, session, um, these students were very eager to meet somebody. But, you know, the person they were going to meet, they had a long line of people that were looking to engage with them, their own colleagues and students. And so they had had a long day as well, you know. And so when these students got up to bat, it was their turn. Um, you know, that person actually had to leave. Um, and they were so upset, right? And, and the truth is that I think everyone really does want to make time to make the connections. Um, but there's just not always enough time. But there are other ways to stay connected and engaged. There are other ways to find opportunities. And I say that because, you know, I, I feel very lucky. I ended up in the Netherlands one summer during law school because I wrote to somebody whose article I really liked. And I said, is there anything I could do to help you? I meant that remotely. Um, but because of the VIS, we met in Vienna, we had a coffee. I seemed, you know, sane and normal and, and perhaps for the summer, at least a good addition to the team. Um, and, so, and so we got along brilliantly and that person remains a mentor, but I didn't go into it expecting, you know, that I would end up at their firm, but what a lovely experience. And, and they were open to it too. And so I, I think that that bodes us for all of us, right? Regardless of our entry level, you just never know where your next opportunity is going to come from. Of course, you don't go into it with the intention of getting something out of it like that. But often in our world, which is small, it's all by recommendation anyway, where we end up, where we do as we keep going. So um, that's always been exciting. You know, who else will you get to meet and, and add to your circle? Now, let me just check with Eric, how's our time? I think we're just about time for, to, to wrap up, is that right? Yes, you are correct, Barry. Okay, so why don't I ask, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Wendy and then Reka, uh, if you have been 30 seconds or so, one final bit of uh, advice or one final observation on networking in a virtual world. Uh, I think probably the most important, and I may well be the least qualified to say it, but, but, you know, understand that everything you put on social media, whether it's your professional networks or your personal networks, is potentially open for public consumption. So I've learned recently that TikTok here in the UK, there's an early bird that U-R-L-E-B-I-R-D that puts all the personal private TikToks on. Um, and I, a friend's daughter has had all of her personal with all her mates at school that she just thought was her friendship group. It's publicly available, I can access it. So just, just be really, really careful about, um, and I say I'm not qualified because I have absolutely no social media presence at all. <laughs> my, my friends, my colleagues and peers um, joke with me about it. They think I'm a spy, but I have LinkedIn and I have no other social media. I just fell between Facebook and things and, and sort of was, was too old for Facebook and too lazy for anything else. But I think it's turned out to be a blessing. Um, and then on LinkedIn, it is a professional network. You know, and, and while all I say about this community and getting to know people, it does blur the lines between professional and, and more friendship relationships, that is still a professional network. So take it offline the, the, the moment, um, you know, it's, it's moving into personal territory and just, just, you know, learn how to use those things so you don't inadvertently put things public. And for anyone else who's been trapped in this, if anything ever pumped, pops up on your LinkedIn feed, which says tap the screen twice, don't. <laughs> That's how you like something. <laughs> and often your most trusted friend will send something because they've made that mistake. So never tap the screen twice. That would be my final advice. <laughs> I, I love that. Um, <laughs> um, I was going to say, you know, as somebody who happens to be on LinkedIn, but doesn't necessarily enjoy being on social media a lot. Um, I have found it's been really helpful to have a sponsor, one that, you know, is a friend that is willing to share your accomplishments, because sometimes we feel, um, you know, it feels egotistical to put your accomplishments, your articles, your whatever out there yourself and be your own marketer. We all have to do it, of course, but if you can find an ally, 
um, who doesn't mind doing it because they enjoy social media and there are lots of people like that um, and to ally with them. And then also be forthright about sharing the things that you're doing and working on. Uh, people really like supporting other people. We know that our community demonstrates this in spades. Um, and so that would be my recommendation. If you don't wanna do it yourself, find your ally and there are lots out there. I found during the, uh, really in the past year, uh, I'm using LinkedIn a lot more. I think the algorithm has started feeding me almost all arbitration related things. And so I learn things, I see things, I connect with some people I wasn't otherwise connected with, or, or more so I stay in touch with people who I know, because there, there's a lot of people I know in, in our world. Um, I've learned that you're, if you comment, uh, apart from helping the, the rank, ranking in the al algorithm, uh, people like that, uh, particularly when, when they posted something thoughtful. And you know, I, I try to not just put a comment in that says great or congrats, but actually say something slightly substantive, uh, but not being, uh, picking up on what Wendy said, not being controversial and not doing anything that uh, when somebody's doing a search on you as an arbitrator is gonna find that you're uh, a danger to, to, to a point. So on that note, uh, let me thank both of you, Wendy and Reka, for your insights on networking. Uh, for those watching on Zoom and YouTube, uh, and there is a recording of, of this workshop like others, and it, it will be posted. Uh, so you're welcome to come back and, and um, or tell your friends to, to come uh, watch this session or watch the other sessions. So uh, Eric, back to you. Okay, uh, we did have uh, somebody who wanted to ask a question. We were just wondering if uh, you'd be open to perhaps taking uh, one. Oh, absolutely, if there's time, sure. I, I, I figure since we're, we're going into the um, networking rooms afterwards, if we had one question, we might as well ask it. Well, I'm Anthony, wrong. go right ahead. Thanks, Eric, and thank you. I, I just couldn't pass up the opportunity to ask networking specialists a question that's always on my mind and a difficulty I have, how do you, and this is when we're, we're back into perhaps in-person networking, how do you um, elegantly leave one group that you're chatting with to move on to another group without it coming off as, all right, I've had enough of you, I now wanna go meet others. How do you find a nice way to do that? I guess the, the method of saying, I think I'm going to be sick now, I've got to leave, doesn't, doesn't work so well. Not for me. Wendy or Rekha, do you have a better suggestion? You know, I, I find this really hard as well, to be totally honest. Um, and it's always apropos when you get to refresh your drink or you have to go to the bathroom. In truth, you can't keep leaving to go to the bathroom or to the bar, or that will elicit other um, sorts of affirmations you don't want. So negative press. But um, I, I, I don't know. I think, I think everyone's trying to do the, the same. Nation. I'm Rebecca Roberts Sorry, in Washington. Something is going up. But Today we celebrate Wendy, the birthday. Oh, sorry, I was just listening to whoever had that in the background. I was, I, it sounded interesting. Um, the uh, yeah, bathroom and drink. Uh, so so <laughs> so um, my dirty secret is I fake drink. So so I'll have a champagne glass of fizzy water um, just because I can't hold my drink very well. So I'm not beyond you know necking that and offering. Does anyone else want a drink? and then going up to the bar and getting everybody drinks, coming, handing them out and then peeling off while they're readjusting themselves. That, that works quite well, can be expensive. Uh, but, um, but also just, um, I don't know, it's active listening, isn't it? When, when you're talking to people, actively listening to what they're saying and then having them feel that they've made the point they want to make with you. Because usually if somebody's hanging on to you, it's because there's still something they want to say to you or, or, or impart to you. So perhaps active listening, so they know you've heard, you know, so if it's students, you know, you're graduating this year, you're going to do your master's in London, we must catch up, I've got your card and I'll make sure we catch up when, when we're in London, call me when you're settled you know that's quite a good way to um you know detach uh 
sometimes people are just holding on to you because you're a crutch. And sometimes if you move away, they'll come with you. <laughs> Uh, that's okay. I've, I've been that puppy <laughs> following someone around who I didn't want to let go of, you know, just, just roll with it, roll with it. Um, but, but yeah, the, the, the bathrooms, um, if, if in doubt, it's always the bathroom. Now, because we're in meeting format, why don't we see if there's anybody else on the platform who has another suggestion? Uh, I, I can, Eric, can they unmute themselves? Yes, they should be able to. Uh, well, maybe. people are thinking about it. Just when Reika was speaking about her, her watching people in, at cocktail events and things, it reminded me of two things that um, people told me about networking at cocktail. Again, this was at Tilney Hall, which is where I sort of first got thrown into this, not knowing anybody. And, you know, in, in my sort of late twenties, the very, very, very senior partner that I worked with at the time um, had said to me on the Sunday morning at breakfast, I'm going home now, I've handed out my packet of cards and, and that's kind of what I came for. And, and then I was talking to a very, very young woman who was um, doing a training contract she was about 22, 23. And I said to her, you're looking tired. She said, yeah, I was in the bar till, in the library bar at Tilney Hall till 3 a.m. And I said, crikey. And she said, well, that's where you, that's where you meet everyone and learn, <laughs> and learn what's really going on. And I thought, gosh, <laughs> she's, she's onto it. And he's really not. <laughs> I always thought that was interesting. And I have to say some of my um, deepest and, and most lasting friendships have, have been those very, very, very late nights. So jet lag can often work in your favor on those things as well. But just, just you know, go go with it with those things. It's, it's sometimes you just have to roll with the waves. Shelby's gonna tell me I should drink this. <laughs> no, not, not, not at all. If, if, if uh, you'll forgive me, I'd like to take us back to LinkedIn just briefly. Sure. Um, in terms of, of arbitration disclosures, uh, how does LinkedIn figure in? Um, I mean, I, I have actually started saying uh, whether I have a LinkedIn contact with someone uh, in when I'm being uh, uh, asked about uh, a possible arbitration gig, and and it it comes up. Uh, I've have done the the I've enjoyed the moot by the way. Congratulations to the people who put this together. Uh, it was really well well done. Um, but I've had, uh, I think, uh, maybe three or four students uh, link in with me. I'm delighted to do that. But I do wonder, as my LinkedIn uh, list grows, uh, if um, you know, how it figures into disclosures. And I would be very grateful to, uh, the, uh, uh, to, to you, uh, anyone, for your views on that. So, Wendy, do I have to make a disclosure that uh, you and I are linked in? Um, yeah. I think it depends. I mean, if I were the only person you were linked in with, mm. um, then, then that would single me out as someone quite, you know, significant in your LinkedIn world. If I'm one of 10,000, mm. you know, it's probably irrelevant. I think with LinkedIn, you're either in or you're out. And I know the recommendation mm. in the US with the judges is, is that you just don't do it. And I know some arbitrators, some very senior arbitrators, Vera Van Hooter is one who will not, she has a LinkedIn, but I've um, asked her to link in with me years ago and she came, she called me and she said, I'm on there because it's, it's a platform, but I don't accept any to keep myself completely neutral. So, so that's one end. Um, and then the other end is if you are actually, you know, more than just a, a advertisement, if you are actually, um, you know, either posting or liking or, or following or things, then I think um, from my point of view, I think the important thing is to try to um, treat people as equally as you possibly can. So if someone links in with me and I don't know them and I've never met them and they haven't been in a class I've just taught or a moot I've just judged or something, I won't accept it because there's a lot of phishing that happens there. And, you know, sure. our security, our cyber security people tell us not to do that because they find out when you're not in the office or the, 
you know, and, and you know, all sorts of problems. So if I don't know the person, um, but if I've taught them, they've been in the class, sometimes I'll check with the professor of the class to make sure they're on the class list. Um, then I do try and accept them, yes. But, but, but I don't think anybody, I mean, I, there are, I don't know how many there are, um, but, but, but I don't think it's enough. I, I think it's too many for that to be a singled out type thing. So Any more than you wouldn't disclose that on a Sunday afternoon on Mother's Day, we were in a virtual room together. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you. Okay. And thank you, Wendy, Reka, and Barry, once again, for that wonderful workshop on networking in a virtual world. I'm sure a lot of us can take some of this information and uh, use it in the future. So uh, everybody involved in the Arbitration Place Invitational Moot was thanked in the closing, uh, except for one amazing person, and that's Kimberly Stewart. So Raven, Eric, and I are going to remedy that now. Kim, on behalf of everyone involved in the Arbitration Place Invitational, the students, the coaches, the arbitrators, the speakers, all the viewers of the five terrific feature events, Anthony Damesis, who was so instrumental in this moot, and the entire Arbitration Place Invitational team. We thank you so much for your vision for Arbitration Place Virtual, for your vision for the pre-moot, for your perseverance throughout, for your leadership, and for making all of this happen. Eric? I'll, I'll, I'll follow you, Barry, and echo what you said. I'd just like to thank everyone for participating in the Arbitration Place Invitational, and a personal thank you to Kim for your assistance, patience, encouragement to us all while planning this pre -moot. We appreciate everything you've done for us at Arbitration Place and for the arbitration community in general. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'd just like to quickly wrap up and once again, thank Kim for her leadership, Vincent Tran Lung for uh, his streaming help, helping us spread these events to anybody around the world and the rest of the support staff at Arbitration Place as well. Uh, they've been great help these past six months and I hope the students have had an opportunity to learn as much as I have. We also hope to host this again next year. Thank you. Next, we will have our keynote discussion on imagining the future of international arbitration. Alex Fessis, the Secretary General of the ICC International Court of Arbitration, and Stephanie Cohen will imagine the future of international arbitration with moderator David Samuels, Managing Editor of Global Arbitration Review. I said this yesterday and I'm going to repeat it today. I would be remiss not to take a moment to thank David for his great support and for the support of Global Arbitration Review since Arbitration Place launched in 2012. Our fifth feature event following the keynote discussion is our final workshop on networking in a virtual world presented by Barry Leon, Wendy Miles, and Reka Rangacheri, all of whom will be more fully introduced later. And that's not the end of the Arbitration Place Invitational. We will end with networking sessions for the students, coaches, and arbitrators who are participating on the Zoom platform. I wish to end by expressing my great gratitude to all of those who made the Arbitration Place Invitational a reality and a success. I thank the students and their coaches already. They were the main event. But of course, there could not have been a pre moot without so many wonderful arbitrators from Canada and around the world giving of their time and energy to preside in the rounds and to provide valuable feedback to the students. Those who participated in the five feature events made the Arbitration Place Invitational so special and I thank each of you so very much. My gratitude to the wonderful team at Arbitration Place who've worked incredibly hard, not only on this pre moot but on the hundreds of virtual proceedings we have done in the past year. A very special thanks to Barry Leon and Professor Anthony Damesis. Barry and Anthony were both instrumental in the planning and organization of the Arbitration Place Invitational. But an even more special thank you to Raven Schofield and Eric Tristan, who led the planning, organization, and presentation of the Arbitration Place Invitational. Raven is a top virtual case manager, and Eric is our virtual hearing and conference manager. They do an incredible job on virtual proceedings, and they've done an incredible job on this pre-moot. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now I turn it over to Eric to introduce David Samuels, Alex Fessis, and Stephanie Cohen. Welcome everyone to our keynote event, Imagining the Future of International Arbitration. I'd like to begin by introducing our keynote speakers and moderators. A Canadian national with nearly 20 years of experience, Stephanie Cohen practices exclusively as an arbitrator based in New York and is duly admitted to the bar both in New York and Ontario. Before launching her arbitrator practice, she worked at White & Case, handling matters arising in the energy and construction sectors. Stephanie regularly participates as faculty in arbitrator training programs run by leading organizations, including the ICC, AAA ICDR, and the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, among others. She speaks frequently about matters of practical and scholarly interest in arbitration and is recognized for her leading role in raising cybersecurity awareness. She received the 2018 CPR Institute Outstanding Professional Article Award for her article, A Call to Cyber Arms, The International Arbitrator's Duty to Avoid Digital Intrusion. Stephanie serves on the ICCA NYC Bar CPR Working Group on Cybersecurity and International Arbitration, which won the 2018 GAR Award for Best Development and recently launched the 2020 Cybersecurity Protocol for International Arbitration. A Cypriot, Alexander Festus is admitted to the Athens Bar and speaks English, French, and Greek. Alex is Secretary General of the ICC International Court of Arbitration and Director of the ICC Dispute Resolution Services. Prior to joining the ICC Court, he practices counsel out of Athens, where he established a sole practice in 2008. As Secretary General of the ICC Court, Alex is responsible for the operational management and coordinates of the ICC Court Secretariat and other dispute resolution services in Paris, Hong Kong, New York, Sao Paulo, and Singapore. He joined the Secretary in late 2011 and held consecutive positions in three case management teams, of which two was counsel. Prior to his appointment as Secretary General, Alex was Secretariat's Managing Counsel for a three-year term. And lastly, David Samuels is a publisher and editor-in-chief of Global Arbitration Review. He is the longest serving journalist at Law Business Research. And since joining in 1999, David has run Global Competition Review and Latin Lawyer as a locum and launched Global Arbitration Review, Global Investigations Review, and Global Restructuring Review. And he has also organized numerous conferences under those brands. David has also studied law at both Oxford and Cambridge. And with that, I'd like to ask our panelists to take it away. Thank you, Eric, for that introduction. Um, thank you, um, organizers, for inviting me to be part of this. It's a great pleasure to be at an event that is not being organized by, by my own organization and, and having to do a spiel about who Global Arbitration Review is. Um, um, as Eric said, I'm David Samuels. I'm connected with, uh, with GAR. Um, for anyone who's on, the, um, um, on this uh, event who doesn't know what GAR is, if the world of international arbitration is a village, then I like to think of us as the village newspaper. Uh, we do our best to tell you everything you need to know about everything that matters and not too much more. Um, our job um, as a trio is to, um, these are my words, maybe not the programs, is to predict the future. And uh, we will get straight, uh, straight into that in a moment. Um, but just a word about the difficulty of predicting the future. Um, I've noticed that often the things I'm asked to speak at are sort of future gazing sessions. So I've done a little bit of looking up uh, famous, famous sort of last words when it comes to predicting things. And, you know, there's, there's the man who told the Beatles that they would never be any good. Um, but my favorite sort of failure of prediction is Margaret Thatcher, who um, said before she became prime minister that there would never be a woman prime minister in her lifetime. Um, it's hard to do better than that. Um, but then as far as the endeavor goes, there's a quote that I also quite like, and it's by Milan Kundera, um, who some of you may know, he's, he's a famous author. Um, and it's man proceeds in the fog, um, in a fog. But when he looks back to judge um, the people of the past, he sees no fog. Um, from his present, which was their faraway future, the past looks perfectly clear to him. Good visibility all the way. Um, he sees the path, he sees the people proceeding, he sees their mistakes and their stumbles, but not the fog. Um, so that is the challenge that we have. We are coming to you from within the fog. Um, if I'd been organized, now I would release some dry ice to sort of underline my point. Um, but if you look back on this event in the future and see what we said, um, go easy on us, uh, because this is a difficult task. Um, 
So um, how can we how can we sort of uh, tackle this idea of, of what the future of international arbitration might look like? Um, I propose the idea that we do it the way that some companies sort of go at things, which is to talk in terms of product and processes and people. And we might also um, use places as a sort of theme um, and uh, sort of look at look under each of these um, either what changes we might expect to see or what things will lead to changes, what pressures are sort of building up under those headings. But before we get to that, I thought I would ask my, my, my fellow panelists, um, if we look back now, sort of 10 years or, or, or longer, um, do they think that the world of international arbitration has really changed? And if so, what are the sort of, what were the drivers of those changes? Were they, were they sort of positive changes, as in the people who are most active and at the heart of international arbitration um, sort of collectively thought this is the thing we should do and made it happen? Or were, were they being reactive to pressures from outside? And, and what were those pressures? Um, I mean, being very sort of flippant and just to sort of um, um, get things moving, you know, if one looks at the world of international arbitration in the year 2000, um, there was there was no global arbitration review, for example. We came along in 2006 and lots of people said, you know, you won't be able to do this. But but we sort of managed to create a new service based on on a, in theory, um, completely confidential process. Um, what else was not a thing then? Um, the world of investment treaty arbitration was was positively booming. Um, there was as yet no backlash against the idea of, of an investment treaty and what it might sort of handcuffs it might put on a government. I remember attending an event about investment treaties to celebrate the 50th year of the first one, which was signed between, between Germany and Pakistan, and asking people what they saw was happening in the world of investment treaty arbitration. Was this going to be some kind of high watermark? Um, and the views were very mixed. But I think, I think, you know, more than 10 years after that, you would say that there's definitely been sort of a change of tone in that area for sure. Um, so, Alex, Stephanie, some general thoughts on, on sort of change in the world of international arbitration and, and what we've seen in the recent past before we look forwards. Um, uh, Alex, I think you were volunteered to go first. So um, what have you got? Not necessarily about this topic, but I'm happy to lead. And, and thank mm -hmm. you, David. Hi, Stephanie. And uh, greetings to all the students with, with warm thanks to Arbitration Place for having invited us to uh, put our minds together to uh, gaze collectively into the crystal ball. Well, I don't know if looking back is very helpful. Uh, I think 10 or 20 years ago, things were extremely different. And since we are, I think, speaking primarily to students, I can draw an analogy, an analogy from the time that I was a student. And I, I, I finished a reputable uh, school, um, law school in my home jurisdiction. And um, at that time, international arbitration was part of an elective course at the very end, uh, at the very end of my, um, you know, first degree studies, uh, it was not considered to be a thing. It was um, premised and presented and taught on the understanding that it was a completely exceptional process, uh, whereby parties derogate from their constitutionally um, um, uh, uh, protected right to resort to the state judge, and of course that anything that happens within that process needs to be very tightly monitored from state courts and indeed uh, very heavily regulated by national laws. So um, obviously, I think the way that arbitration is being taught today has changed a lot in that regard. And drawing an analogy again from that, I think what we see today, at least in the context of commercial arbitration, is that it's not, it's not at all considered to be an exception, uh, but rather um, a, a, a viable option, if not the standard option for a number, a number of disputes that uh, we currently see um, administered uh, in our respective institutions are ultimately, of course, going, going before ad hoc tribunals. That would be the first point. I think the second thing is, um, and I can't avoid speaking about technology. I, 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 I have read a book recently, which I very highly, very much recommend to everyone. Uh, it's the most recent book by Professor Richard Susskind on online courts and the future uh, of justice. And one of the things that he is saying, and, and he's an expert in, in the use of technology in transitioning into online courts, and not, it's, this is not arbitration specific, but one of the things he was saying uh, back at the time when he was um, uh, invited by the UK Law Commission to propose changes, which was about 10, 15 years ago, is that his prediction was that everything was going to be email. Um, so, uh, um, you know, we don't really need to say anything much further than that, uh, given the plurality of digital means that we use today to communicate, uh, which still include email, 
but include also a variety of other um, of other uh, digital means, um, and, and that is an advantage. But I, for me, it's all, there's also a question of capacity. We should always be aware of. I'll give you a very simple example. Um, I at the SEC court, we registered a case a couple of days ago where the claimant party is asking us to uh, notify the request for arbitration by courier, which is standard, but also by fax. Uh, so um, I think we need to bear in mind that there are uh, obviously areas that uh, are quickly and have quickly uh, much evolved and continue to evolve, but there is still some capacity buildup, I'll, I'll call it that, that, that you know, still, still is missing. Um, that's very interesting. I remember when there was the furore about Lionel Messi leaving Barcelona, and the whole of that was triggered because he sent a certain type of fax and if he hadn't sent the right type of fax, then nothing. And, and everyone's like, really? The world of football uh, faxes? But yeah, it, it's, a, it's a fine point. Um, Stephanie? Well, I mean, it's funny you say that, David, because, you know, the first um, case I had as an, as an arbitrator, I remember having to deal with the parties by fax. And um, that, that wasn't that long ago that that still, you know, fit in there. That was about 10 years ago. Um, and, you know, boy, how, how things have, have changed. I think, you know, um, going back to what Alex was saying about the way in which um, we've seen international arbitration being taught, um, I think one of the biggest differences we've seen in the last 10 years, and this is where I, I do think is a huge driver for change going forward, is the rise of a younger generation of practitioners all of these young arbitration groups, you know, ICC, YAF, all, all the institutions have these group, IBA under 40 groups, um, have made a huge difference in giving a stage to people at a much younger um, point in their careers. And I think have given an opportunity for them to, to get known and to, to branch out into what is also becoming uh, a sort of a, a new thing, which is the idea of a younger class of, of arbitrators, um, totally unheard of 20, 20 years ago. Um, 10 years ago, I went out on my own uh, after about 10 years of practice and there were, weren't really very many people I could um, identify who had done that as well. But, you know, just in GAR last week, I read about somebody who was going out after seven years of practice, going out to be an arbitrator. And you were reading a few more of these stories. And I think, um, one of the reasons why is because there's greater recognition that um, there are sort of horses for courses and that there's different um, international arbitration today looks different than it did before. It's not all the same type of um, mass case. There, there really is a huge proliferation of the smaller cases as well that, um, you know, the younger, the younger generation can serve a little bit differently. So I think that's, that's one of the big drivers of change. Um, and just the one other thing I'll, I'll mention at this point is more recently in the last five, five years, we've seen um, the emergence of a number of, of, of small groups, uh, practitioner oriented groups um, coming up with newer ideas like um, the campaign for greener arbitration is something from, from the last two years, uh, which is really trying to promote uh, more focus on, on environmental uh, elements. Um, the pledge focusing on diversity. Um, even, the, even the cybersecurity protocol, the ICA New York City Bar uh, CPR cybersecurity protocol, while that one is joined to a couple of institutions, really was coming from, from practitioners being interested in focusing more on, on cybersecurity. So, you know, in that 10, 20, 20 years ago, um, all change came in a sort of a top down, in a very much a different kind of top down process from organizations like the IBA or from, you know, the, the folks very much at the top of the field. There were three or four books that I recall being told to look at when I was told to research things as a, as a young associate. And now it's not just GAR. We have, you know, Kluwer online. We have a, no shortage of information available about, informa uh, about international arbitration. And so there's really been this sort of democratization uh, in international arbitration. And that's going to be a huge driver of change going forward. Yeah, I mean... Um... I like to think that GAR has sort of been 
part of that. And, and I remember the conversations with people, as I alluded to in the early days, where they would go, don't you realize that arbitration is a confidential process? And we would sort of, you know, go, well, yes, but we still think we can, we can do some work here that will, you know, uh, will be interesting for people to read and we'll keep people in touch with what's going on. Um, and I do think Alex's point about, um, well, the teaching of international arbitration seems to me to sort of be a, a facet of, of just the general awareness of international arbitration. When I was a law student years ago, didn't hear about it. And if I had done, I might have actually been more tempted to remain sort of on the on the lawyer path rather than heading in the direction I did, because, you know, the sort of the rather domestic options that sort of seemed to be available to me didn't appeal. And when I went and studied international law of some type, I thought, oh, this is this is even worse than the than, than UK land law. Right. Um, I, I don't enjoy this at all. But I, I do think I would have been quite happy in the world of international arbitration. I mean, I am now from the, the stance I have, but I think I could have enjoyed it um, as a practitioner. Um, so that is. And, you know, and, David, just on that point, I mean, I think maybe Steph and I took took the different turn that well, the turn that you ultimately took just a little bit earlier. But I think, I'll, you know, what what's really important here, and you've just said it, and I think Steph too, is that we have resources on the one hand, which very amply um, describe to anyone who's interested what arbitration is about, and that and on, in that you have academic treatises, you have blogs, you have articles, you have news uh, and the sharing of information, which is something that GAR does. You have, um, you know, we can speak about further transparency things like the things that ICC is doing and, and other institutions as well. But there is much more awareness with regard to the way that arbitration operates as a process and as a product. And I think this has led to the other big thing that is still in development and will drive, I think, change uh, over the next 10, 20, 30 years. And that is its proliferation. And it's, you know, we, can, we can address that in the context of industries. We can discuss that in the context of um, uh, specific contracts uh, or uh, you know, geographical areas. And, and even in areas which were just never considered to be part of the part and parcel of arbitration, such as you know, low, low value disputes. And I think ultimately this is, in my view, what's going to be one of the major, major changes over the next 10 to 20 years. Well, probably 10 years. Uh, that, that wider use of arbitration in, in fields, uh, which uh, currently, um, you know, present day practitioners uh, have, not, have not necessarily considered. It isn't it this, oh, go ahead, David. No, you go, Stephanie. You go. Well, I, you know, there's one driver that's, that we haven't mentioned, which is sort of a bit of the elephant in the room. And I think it's actually the biggest driver in where we're headed. And, um, and that, that is the, the pandemic. Um, and it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's, nobody wants to find a, a silver lining in a, in a pandemic, but for the practice of international arbitration, it has been incredibly transformative. And the longer that the pandemic continues, the more transformative it will be because, you know, it's sort of a tired, a tired phrase that, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. Um, but, you, lawyers are conservative, and unless you you force people to do differently things differently, they don't. Uh, you know, using Zoom, using video conferencing—that's some, not something new. Um, the possibility of doing things paperlessly, not not new, but people have been forced to do it in a way that they haven't before, and that is allowing the institutions to embrace technology in a way that they haven't before to say, you know what, we want you to do every, do all of your filing um, on, online. We want you to communicate by email, start to think about online case management platforms and really sort of propel things forward in a way that we didn't, that we didn't before. Um, and so I think, you know, we're gonna see a lot more competition amongst the institutions and in trying to drive that product um, uh, differently to recognize that it, you know, it, it is a service that's, that's being provided and it's the, to maximize and leverage the technology that we're using now is really dependent on the, I think in part, the institutions being able to jump in and, and say, um, we're going to take what's been happening now and we're going to push it, we're going to push it forward, push it forward by offering things to both, not just the, the folks at the high end who can afford it, but you know, those at the lower end um, who may not have the capacity to, to do things on their own, we're going to offer a different kind of product, a different kind of service that um, really leverages the technology. 
So this is, I, is interesting I because agree more. I, I, um, I told you I would ask you a question about product. And I, I agree that there is a lot of, there's a lot of stuff getting sorted out now that should be sorted out, such as the ability to administer your case through an online platform where, you know, sharing documents with your team and with your opponent, with the arbitrators is, is as simple as sort of <laughs> clicking the right buttons, right? That, that, that should happen. But it, it does seem to me that, that at heart, you know, the product international arbitration remains in some ways as it has always been, right? It is, it is, I will say paper-based argumentation, but I may mean, you know, electronic document, but it's extensive argumentation through memorials followed by an oral hearing of some sort leading to a binding result that is enforceable that does not have, in theory, an appeal attached to it, right? That, that remains the basic format. And, and I've been surprised at the degree to which that remains sort of unchallenged because I, I have, you know, I have conversations with quite senior arbitrators who will occasionally say to me, I don't see the point of a hearing these days. I've done enough of them now to know that the most of the time nothing really changes. Right. You know, I think we could do away with that. That would be quite a radical change. But, but equally, it's not one I see being embraced anytime soon because the economics and the vested interests, this is where people make their money. So while I think there is a lot of smoothing out going on and there's a lot of scope for, for someone to come in with, with something innovative, it doesn't seem to happen as much as I would expect. You know, the, it's not as if Singapore is offering a vastly different approach to international arbitration than London is or Paris is. Um, does that pr pr prompt any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it, it's... Yeah, go ahead. I, you're right. I, people don't, people are scared of being innovative. And I think, you know, a, a great example, David, in, in thinking about the changes in hearings is the, the idea of having um, pre-recorded opening, opening statements. So um, in order to deal with the time zone differences that arise and converting to sort of the virtual format, one thing you could do is have the parties pre-record their opening statements um, the, and then let the tribunal watch them before coming together and then ask questions of the parties or do it a week beforehand or have uh, the equivalent of a written submission presented together with an oral, you know, recorded statement that's provided to the tribunal earlier on. If you, I have used the pre-recorded opening statement out of necessity at this point during the pandemic and shockingly thought it worked very well. There's potential for mischief, sure. So we need to, to, work, um, to work on that. But when I've mentioned it to people, um, people have been highly resistant to it. And it's because yeah. nobody wants to try it for the first time. And in a legal proceeding where you can't appeal, that's, that's what makes it difficult. So, you know, how do we really kind of, that's why I say, I think the longer the pandemic goes on, the more we're likely to see things because we're going to be willing yeah. out of necessity to try to try new things. That's not something I think, um, you know, would have been palatable to parties were it not for trying to bridge a time, dome, time zone difference and make it a little bit easier so that, you know, there was less pleading that had to be done orally at an awkward time of day. Um, but once you sort of start to do that, you can start to think about ways in which you might use it differently. Um, and it really does prompt me to think, you know, when you're having the, the scheduling of submissions, it would be so much more beneficial to, to get, um, you know, the, the online tutorial from an expert at the same time as you get an expert witness statement to get it earlier in the case. Uh, those are things that you can start to think about when you're using video that, that we haven't done before, but it really is prompted by, by being forced by being forced to do things differently, mm. not out of choice. And it may sound odd that we're actually in a way almost wishing that the pandemic uh, 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 lasts for a little bit longer, but it is true that it is a huge accelerator for positive change because it does allow us to catapult ourselves further in trying to find solutions because there are no other options. And I think that's a huge driver for change. At the same time, I think uh, apart from that, one of the more uh, sort of like stable uh, points of prediction will have to cross the, you know, the, the moving stones of efficiency and predictability. I think that's why it, to use that, you know, the description that you, you, you very helpfully made, David, as to what is the standard arbitral uh, process, um, finding ways to, you know, to work, you know, uh, around it and find better ways of doing it 
always stumbles upon the fact of finality, lack of appeal, and ultimately the fact that there's court review in at least, you know, in at least two stages after the award is rendered. So I think the problem that arbitrators sometimes face is that. Um, I think in that regard, I don't know if we will be able to find a solution within the next five years that is going to be, re it's going to allow us to reinvent the wheel between, you know, what I would say is like a standard arbitration, although that thing doesn't really exist. I hate using it. Let's just use it now for, for the purpose of this discussion. I think what we will see changing, and again, I will mention lower, uh, lower uh, dollar disputes, not because those are going to go into sort of like an economy class arbitration. I don't believe in that. They are going to go into, again, a full assessment, but that assessment will be done in the context of a different process. And that process can be an online process. And it will be, again, coming with guarantees but, you know, when your claim is $10,000 or $100,000, you may not need, well, actually, you don't need uh, 12 months and hearings necessarily and, you know, discovery necessarily and witness statements and witness depositions and expert reports. Um, and ultimately, it does um, rely on not just the technology of it, but also some confidence in the fact that arbitrators will need to exercise some additional discretion. Again, weighing those two factors of predictability and efficiency to come up to a fair result. And ultimately, this is, I think, the big, um, the big challenge for the next 10 years for all of us, including institutions. Um, it, all of this is an accelerator towards ensuring access to justice. And this is basically what arbitral institutions are doing. Uh, we're not here to make money. We're not profit. Most of our, most arbitral institutions are not for-profit organizations. So they're here basically to act as facilitators for the rendering of justice. And we do that in a manner complementary to state courts. So I think ultimately the ability to move part of those emerging new markets or areas, if you like, of dispute resolution to an online environment, uh, I think is, is ultimately going to come back into the standard arbitration form and, um, inform a discussion perhaps on how that's going to change um we are we are being defeated by time but this is this is fabulous stuff and i i, I wish we had another half an hour but um, unfortunately we don't um i i agree with with um uh, everything both of you said i think you know international arbitration exists because something like it has to exist right it it meets a demand um and it's it's odd it's odd how sort of vested interest and economic interest then get in the way of, of it being the best version of itself. But I think they do. And as you say, the pandemic is forcing people to sort of realize that things can be done a different way. Um, if anybody has, doesn't know about it, there's a thing called the, base, uh, the Basketball Arbitration Tribunal. And I think this is a great example of someone tweaking the arbitration process to exactly fit a particular category of users. It's for the non-US basketball players who play around the leagues of Europe and they move quite frequently and they needed to be able to move and be certain that if they went to play for a team in Turkey or Greece or somewhere else and the, and the team didn't pay them, they had legal recourse and they weren't happy about going to the local courts necessarily. And they wanted a quick result so they could then move before the end of the season and continue to earn for their family. So the, the basketball arbitration tribunal offers them a super fast result, you know, within months. And the arbitrator is, is sort of given carte blanche to deal with the case as they see fit, right? It's called ex equio bono, I, I believe, right? It's just on fairness alone. And, and people seem to really like it and it really suits that, that sort of um, niche. So there's an awful lot more that I think um, can be done, no doubt will be done. Um, alas, we have to hand back to the, the, the main event now. Um, so I will just conclude by uh, sort of referring to my point about predicting the future is extremely difficult because of the fog. Um, it's a lot easier to predict the past. And I can prove this by referring to a lovely Chairman Mao anecdote. As you know, he was occasionally asked things like, um, you know, what do you think of the French Revolution? He would say it's too early to say. My favorite one is, is allegedly he was asked, um, how would the world have been different if instead of JFK being shot, it had been Nikita Khrushchev who had been killed by a sniper? And he said, oh, that's easy. Um, Arionassus never would have married Mrs. Khrushchev. So on that, um, note um kim eric um thank you for the platform i hope you enjoyed our um our turn yes we certainly did thank you stephanie david and alex for your time and thoughts uh, on what the future holds for arbitration as david has mentioned it's not an easy task and i would say that you did a great job although we won't be able to prove it until much later
I wish to end by expressing my great gratitude to all of those who made the Arbitration Place Invitational a reality and a success. I thank the students and their coaches already. They were the main event. But of course, there could not have been a pre-moot without so many wonderful arbitrators from Canada and around the world giving of their time and energy to preside in the rounds and to provide valuable feedback to the students. Those who participated in the five feature events made the Arbitration Place Invitational so special and I thank each of you so very much. My gratitude to the wonderful team at Arbitration Place who've worked incredibly hard, not only on this pre-moot, but on the hundreds of virtual proceedings we have done in the past year. A very special thanks to Barry Leon and Professor Anthony Damesis. Barry and Anthony were both instrumental in the planning and organization of the Arbitration Place Invitational. But an even more special thank you to Raven Schofield and Eric Tristan, who led the planning, organization, and presentation of the Arbitration Place Invitational. Raven is a top virtual case manager, and Eric is our virtual hearing and conference manager. They do an incredible job on virtual proceedings, and they've done an incredible job on this pre-moot. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So uh, everybody involved in the Arbitration Place Invitational Moot was thanked in the closing, uh, except for one amazing person, and that's Kimberly Stewart. So Raven, Eric, and I are going to remedy that now. Kim, on behalf of everyone involved in the Arbitration Place Invitational, the students, the coaches, the arbitrators, the speakers, all the viewers of the five terrific feature events, Anthony Damesis, who was so instrumental in this moot, and the entire Arbitration Place Invitational team. We thank you so much for your vision for Arbitration Place Virtual, for your vision for the pre-moot, for your perseverance throughout, for your leadership, and for making all of this happen. Eric? I'll, I'll, I'll follow you, Barry, and echo what you said. I'd just like to thank everyone for participating in the Arbitration Place Invitational, and a personal thank you to Kim for your assistance, patience, encouragement to us all while planning this pre -move. We appreciate everything you've done for us at Arbitration Place and for the arbitration community in general. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'd just like to quickly wrap up and once again, thank Kim for her leadership, Vincent Tran Lung for uh, his streaming help, helping us spread these events to anybody around the world and the rest of the support staff at Arbitration Place as well. Uh, they've been great help these past six months and I hope the students have had an opportunity to learn as much as I have. We also hope to host this again next year. Thank you. <laughs>